Welcome back to the Son of a Blitch podcast. I'm your host, George Blitch. I'm here with my co-host, Matthew Mitchell, and we're here with our very special guest today, Jeremiah Doughty. And Jeremiah is a man who has many different things going on. You probably know him best from Field to Plate, and he also has a podcast of the same name as well as a YouTube channel. I'm sure that you've all seen his Instagram channel and a lot of his amazing dishes that he has created as he's cooking. He has some um, hunting classes as well. So there's a lot of things we're going to dive into today. Uh, Jeremiah, thank you so much for joining us here. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So one thing that I was kind of curious about, um, I had read through on your website about your history of becoming a hunter. I know back in 2010, there was a kind of a big change that kind of led to you moving into the hunting world. Can you kind of walk us through how you became and, and why you became a hunter? Yeah, I mean, I was a, a bird hunter since I was six years old. I'm at, here in Southern California, that's primarily what we're hunting is upland game birds, uh, just because it's so easy. And we're in that Pacific flyaway, so we get all the waterfowl. We have three types of quail here. We've got three types of dove, four, one you can't legally shoot. So, but um, And so upland game bird hunting was it, from turkey to quail to pheasant. And, you know, if it flies, it dies. That was the motto. I've got like 40 different shotguns. And in 2010, I really didn't really have a desire to hunt a game because I didn't. For A, no one was over there to teach me. My whole family, all the way down to my grandparents and whatever, it was all bird hunters. And two, just the financial aspect of it. I'd see these guys just dropping hundreds of bills to go shoot a deer. And I'm like, it's what's, what's the point when I can go out and shoot half less money and have way more fun shooting birds, um, and have the dogs run and sit on the water and that kind of stuff. So, but I started getting really sick. Um, and this is kind of, yeah, 2008, 2009 was starting to get like sick when I was eating and I was working in the restaurant industry. Um, and so I'd eat and it would be like the worst flu of your life, for like four hours, just hit you instantly within like 20 minutes after eating. And it was one of those deals where I was like, what is going on with my body? And we're again, working in the, in the food industry, you can't just be out for four hours. Like if you're managing, you're cooking, you're, you know, make sure your staff's all taken care of. It's, you can't just be like, okay, Hey, during the rush, I'm out, I'm in the bathroom piece. Um, and so started researching it and people, you know, going to all these different specialists, gut doctors and you name it. And they're like, Oh, well it's gluten. I'm like, no, I eat peanut butter and jellies nonstop. That's the only thing that doesn't jack me up. Oh, well it's, it's celiac. So it's all, no, it's not silly. Oh, it's dairy. I'm like, no, I can drink a whole glass of milk. And so fast forward, taking two to three years to find this out, finally found this, this micro gut biologist specialist. who's like, mm, I want to try something out. And she's like, well, you're allergic to bovine fat. Um, so if anyone is like, whoa, whoa what's bovine fat? Uh, cow, pretty much anything that has to do with or has any part of a cow in it, even from like jellos where they use, you know, the hoofs and, and the stuff of cattle, all that stuff, my body rejects and has to get rid of it as fast as it can. Um, builds it up to an allergy where it affects my skin, it affects my body, it affects, you know, starting to get hives and rashes. And, and it's crazy because born and raised an Irish kid, meat and potatoes was life, you know, we were poor, right? right. And so mom would buy those 400 pound slap, you know, that, that tube of ground beef at Costco and you'd go through that an entire week. And, uh, so it really was kind of a punch in the gut, literally where it was like, what do I do? I, there's no way I can just live off chicken alone, um, and pork alone, but that big game hunting never even entered the, the realm of my thought. Um, then I was out getting ready for Turkey archery season for fall season and met this old timer at the archery range and he showed up and he had a camouflage bow and a camouflage case. And again, living in Southern California, you see someone that has a moss, you know, that's not just like says Volcom on it or van skate shop or something in camouflage, but something that says mossy Oak or something that said Kuyu or something that said Sitka. You're like, Hey, you spent money on that. Um, and so we got this conversation and he was telling me all about, uh, Wyoming and hunting antelope and how to hunt a doe antelope license and tag at the time was like $36. And I went, license and a tag, 36 bucks. He's like, yeah, that's what it is. And this is before it was a popular place to hunt. So me and a buddy, we went and we literally got tags and never big game hunted before ever. Bought a rifle, bought a scope from Walmart, didn't know what we were doing. Um, I think like a $20 Bushnell, you know, like the ones that go on your BB guns. Put it on a 30-06, yeah, <laughs> which is, you know, it's not made for that. Uh, and we went out there, we ended up struggling for a week, but we ended up getting some antelope does and brought the meat home and absolutely hated it. 
didn't know how to cook it. Didn't know what I was doing. You know, all these, all these things that the horror stories of antelope. Um, and that kind of thrust me into this idea of like, well, I was born and raised. If you kill it, you eat it. And so if you kill it and you eat it, I killed it. I have to eat this thing. And so it really forced my hand in, into what I am doing today was because in 2010, there wasn't really anybody to look at, you know, you've got, you didn't have Steve Ranella out there doing meat eater. You didn't have, you know, you look on Instagram now, there's 5,000 wild game chefs because a bunch of stay at home moms and stay at home dads are like, oh, we're wild game chefs. And there wasn't any of that stuff to look up to, which I think are amazing. I love that they're all out there because it really gives validity to what I'm doing and what other people are doing. And then there was like Scott Ray, but it was very high end cooking. And I'm like, dude, I'm not a high end cooking guy. Like, again, I'm born and raised meat potatoes. So I said, there's got to be a better way. And, you know, fast forward. 12 years later. And this is what I'm doing full time all because I hated the taste of antelope and I'm allergic to beef. So I got all the time people like, Oh, I'm so sorry. You can't eat a steak. I'm like, Oh, I'm so sorry. You couldn't eat that Neil guy that I killed <laughs> or you can, or you can't eat that. You know, I went to Hawaii and shot a bunch of access. Oh, I'm so sorry. You can't eat all that access that I just shot off the side of a volcano eating volcanic grass, but you go ahead and eat your Walmart grass fed beef. Cheers. You know, I can relate though. The, you know, d- during that, I, I started hunting, maybe 10, 12 years ago myself. And I grew up fishing, but um, the the big introduction to it was just worked with, that had some coworkers that I was working with who were who were hunters. And uh, they asked me to come along. And also it was a time when I think we were starting to like kind of figure out problems with grain and grain fed cow, big industry, cattle, all that kind of stuff. And, and so it really caught my attention. But you're right. There was nothing at the time. I mean, like uh, Scott Ray was about the only place where you can go and watch like a 30 minute YouTube video on how to break down, you know, the hind hind quarter or, or just like, you know, the different the different primal cuts, et cetera, you know. And so it, a lot has changed. And and so I could see how in the early part of when you were getting started and, and thinking about um, how to bring this maybe to attention um it's like any good business often starts with like there's nothing else out there i need to provide this for myself you know yeah no and that's i remember sitting in the field with that first antelope and i had a little pocket knife a little swiss army pocket knife that i got when i was 13 years old and i don't think it ever would sharpen and i'd whittled 10 billion sticks with it and i'm sitting there like i don't know how to gut this thing i don't know what to do like i've got this animal laying on the ground what about what's next you know, I went on YouTube, but back then it was all about like funny cat videos and guys getting hit in the nuts. And so I found a video and it was this redneck that put a golf ball in the, in the hide, wrapped it and took off in his big old raised Chevy truck and it pulled all the skin off. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm in the middle of nowhere, Wyoming, where I don't get cell service barely. And I'm sitting on top of a hill. There's no way I'm going to do this. And so I, I mean, I just struggled through it. And I remember going there, there's, there's gotta be a better way. And every organization out there focuses on kids, right? Teach the kid to hunt. I'm at at the time, what that was 12 years ago. So I'm 27, 28 years old. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing as an adult, let alone have some mentor. And you, you asked anybody back in the day, they'd be like, Oh, well, uh, you know, your dad didn't teach you. I'm like, no, my dad, my dad taught me how to put my thumb up, up a dove's butt and pull apart a breast. Like that's, the extent of what I was taught, you know, how to do it. And then how to cook it was throw some seasoning salt on it, throw it on a grill and choke it down because you had to overcook it because that's just what you did. And so, no, there wasn't anyone there. And it, it was, it was a struggle. And then even watching like Scott stuff, he was using different animals because, you know, he's over in Europe. So he's mm-hmm. using these deer that are the size of my dog, my lap. Much smaller. Yeah, you're right. And he's using yeah. domesticated hogs or wild Russian boar. But again, these Russian boars, have been castrated. So they're more of these big boars. So they've got huge fat on them. I go and shoot a little, you know, a little 80 pound sow who has no fat on her. I can't even get a pork chop off of her. And I'm like, it's beautiful, but what do I do? You know, it's great that I can take the concept of that. But, 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 but then again, it was even his stuff back then. I've talked to Scott many times. He was, he was doing it because he loved it and he was doing it for his cookbook and he was doing film, but even watching some of his videos, it was very hard to follow because he was trying to do so much. And cause I think back then you can only have a 26 minute video on YouTube. So everything had to be compiled in 26 minutes, even though it might've taken him whatever. So the cuts were all and So yeah, as you're saying, it was a very, very hard time to, to figure it out. 
And it took me a couple of years before I really kind of understood it. And I started going, there's got to be, somebody's got to step up and kind of fix this mentality. But you, you then found, if I understand correctly, different sources, like you, you, you dove back into the books and, and looked at butchery books that are 100, 150 years old, yeah. I think is what I've heard before, right? Yeah. And so that's my, you know, I was, I was a homeschooled kid. Mm-hmm. And so unlike being a school kid where you're like, you're being forced, like, hey, this is your history book that you're learning. When I was growing up, it was always like we went to the, you know, your subject was gold mining. Just just throw that out there. I remember in 13 years old, we were learning about the California gold rush. And my mom took us to the library and said, get every book you can get on gold mining, gold rush, gold this, gold that, and you need to write a report. And at the end of the report, we went up Highway 395 and we gold panned all the way up to, to Oregon for like two weeks as part of our final project, which again, I look at kids nowadays, I'm like, you're sitting there for hours and hours in school and I got to go gold pan when you guys were in the middle of school. Um, but it was this mentality that I have is like, hey, you're forced to understand it. If you don't know it, figure it out. Uh, go to the library and do it. So what I started doing is like you were saying, I, I reached out to the past because all the present type stuff just wasn't there. So finding books from, you know, the 1880s in France on how to, on how to butcher down a, a lamb or a goat, uh, you know, a lamb and a goat is the same exact size as, as, a, as an antelope, same body style, same cuts, same everything, same amount of fat. And so, okay, I'm going to look at that. Then going, you know, to our farm area, like an hour and a half away up in Temecula and finding a guy who's processing um, hogs. You know, I called this old timer. Um, he's passed away recently, but I call him up and I was like, Hey, I want to learn how to butcher. He's like, no, you don't, you know, know, that's, it's a lost art. You don't want to learn it. Blah, blah, blah. I was like, no, I I really like, I'm a hunter. I want to learn how to do it. He's like, no, 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 no. If you're going to, if you're going to do it, be here at two o'clock in the morning on Tuesday. And so I remember two o'clock, I got up at like midnight, drove there, got donuts, got coffee, was sitting on this dude's porch in the middle of nowhere in a farm. And he comes walking out and goes to put on just, you know, his shit kickers. And he's like, who are you? And I was like, oh, I called. My name is Jeremiah. I want to learn how to butcher. He's like, oh, you were serious. All right. Well, who's that coffee for? I was like, it's for you. He's like, who's that donut? He's like, I'm like, it's for you. He sat down the porch, put on his boots, drank his coffee, ate his donut, didn't say a word to me. And then he's like, okay, let's go. Let's go shoot some pigs. And remember we walked over, he pulls an old rusty 22 out of his, you know, side holster and goes to shoot a pig. I was like, I'll shoot it. He's like, all right, shoot it right there. We shot this giant 400 pound pig, took it into this butcher house. And he goes, okay, there's, there's three things. One, you're going to watch me. You're going to watch. You're going to ask questions. Two, you're going to get in there. I'm going to cut the, I'm going to cut the next pig in half and you're going to be doing side by side. Three, I'm going to go probably go take a shit because you gave me coffee and a donut and you're going to butcher down a third pig by yourself and I'll come back. And I remember going, dude, I just, I literally, this is the first time I ever like grabbed a butchering knife and I watched him and then him and I split it. And then he's like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to go do my do. And I sat there and struggled doing that pig. And I came back. He's like, well, here's a nice chest. That pig you butchered is yours. Thanks for helping me out. And, and I went back a couple of times and then he called me up. He's like, I got a cow. You want to learn how to butcher a cow? I was like, I'll come learn how to butcher a cow. Yes. And so again, it was this old guy who took the time to kind of mentor me. I only did it three or four times with him, but the next season when antelope came, I felt confident enough to not take it to a, but I've only taken one animal to a butcher ever in my entire life. And that was that very first year. Mm-hmm. I felt comfortable. I felt confident. And then as I'm there, I, we, I brought like three other friends with me. They're like, well, can you teach us? And I was like, sure. There's, you guys can watch me do mine and then I'll help you do yours. And then you guys can do your own because you know, this whole mentality of you can only teach someone once and then they have to get hands on, I think was really huge and beneficial. And I still, my classes that I still do today, it's still the same. I quote the same thing to these guys. I'm like, okay, first you're going to watch me. Second, I'm going to be in there with you. Third, I'm going to walk away. I'm going to come back and I'm going to, and I'm going to congratulate you on how beautiful it looks. Cause that old timer never looked at me and said, Hey, you messed up on that ham hock. Hey, you messed up on that chop. Hey, he, he literally said, he looked at me and goes, no, oh, that's just another meatball. And he throws it in the grind pile. Oh, it's just another meatball throw. And I still, you, you've heard it. If you listen to my podcast, you hear me say it. It's just another meatball. He, the meat's going to get used. If it, even if it doesn't look like a beautiful pork chop, it's still your pork chop. You did it with your hands and all this little, you know, grisly bits, throw it in the, it's just another meatball. And so to me, that was huge. And I'm trying to kind of pass that along, but yeah, books, I've got so many, so many amazing books that are old, new, some of the new ones out there, I think they get too showy. They're very, very sure. hard to follow. Those old ones were made like, like textbooks, like step A, 
throw the animal here. Step two, cut here. Now they're like, oh, go ahead and grab your blank, blank knife, fill in the blank and use this. And people are like, well, I don't have that knife. I guess I can't do it. Look at some of these books. These old timers are using like literally a buck knife that they sharpen a stone. Well, what are, do you have a, a several that would, that you could recommend? I mean, cause there, there are definitely people out there who, who don't enjoy taking their meat to the processor, but they're still intimidated by the whole process, you know, or they, they might just do the same thing over and over. And, um, you know, there might be another technique in there waiting for them if they had a source. Yeah. I know for me personally, this year I'm, I'm building my whole, I'm, I'm building a repertoire for people, which is going to be amazing. It's not out. My, my goal is to have it out next summer um, that people can literally look at. But some of my favorite ones that I, that I love, like The Butcher's Apprentice is, a, is an amazing book. It's an older book. Uh, you can pick it up on Amazon. Uh, there's also a, a place called like thriftbooks.com um, and it's all a bunch of used books. Uh, so think of it like a thrift store for books. Um, and you can literally go on there and you just type in butchering and it's like just mass and it's people selling. It's like, a, it's like an eBay without bidding for, for people to buy books. And it's, it's, a, it's a great place. Um, another one, which is one of my favorites is butchering, processing and preserving of meat, the ultimate guide to, to home butchering. Um, and, but it's yeah, butchering, processing and preserving meat. So it talks about everything, like how to preserve the meat with salting and canning. Again, it's, it's an older book. There's these things that a lot of us, you know, it's not vacuum sealing. It's not wrapping in, you know, it's in saran wrap. It's how do you preserve this meat to last you your season? Like uh, salt and stuff like that is what you're. Yeah, salt cures, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. sausages, jerkies, canning, which I think is beautiful. A lot of people get away from canning, but with the way the world is, like, I can a crap ton of venison because mm-hmm. it's great to pull out, dump in stew, dump in tacos, dump in tamales, dump in fill in the blank. Any any shredded meat you need, even the can, like I'll take grind and make taco seasoning and can it. And you pull it out and you just brown it up, and it's it's beautiful. Uh, but my third one is like how to prepare any animal, bird for the table or freezer. And that's the guide to home butchering. And they've got, it was written, I think back in like the eighties by a bunch of hunters who were also farmers in, I think they were Wisconsin. And so you've got these cool old black and white pictures of deer. And it's funny too, because you know, they're not these giant 10 point racks that we're used to seeing everywhere. Right. These beautiful little forkies or a three by two or, you know, or, or like whitetail hunters. Yeah. The meat tastes the same. You know, five point, you know, I'm used to mule deer. So three by two or whatever. Yeah, the meat tastes. I mean, I think it tastes, it tastes better. The, same. the younger they are, the tastier they are. Um, so yeah, those are kind of like my three like top ones that I love, and they're they're made by people. They're not made by these professional people, you know, chefs who are out there. These professional butchers who are trying to like fill a quota. These are like, hey, you want to be a butcher? Here's the Butcher's Apprentice book. Read this. It's the Bible, and it it really breaks it down. It's really kind of a cool a cool book. So you, when did you actually? kind of launched field to plate so it sounds like you had many years of experience where you're kind of getting in there you're doing it on your own you're kind of learning you're you're you know checking out these butchering books and you know with that that gentleman who kind of was a mentor of sorts and then you're kind of getting in there and i know best way to do it is kind of be doing it yourself but you got these pointers along and then you decide to form your company to kind of do that And, and was it at first just the idea of making videos was was did you have kind of a long-term goal of what you were going to build this into or did it kind of organically grow into what it is now which is multifaceted approach and and from what i'm seeing yeah no i had no plan at all i loved the restaurant business i loved the industry um and there was never really a hey i'm gonna quit my job and and pursue you know hunting as a career because you know, that's always that little kid's dream is like, Oh, I'm going to go travel the world and hunt. Yeah. Um, and then, um, so for me, it was kind of just, it was like a, like that snowball effect, right? Just more and more things. I remember I, I, my first real antelope dish that I made that we loved, I made a homemade teriyaki. I put them on skewers, you know, I just grilled them and Mossy Oak reached out. They're like, Hey, can we share your picture? This is back when I was just like, you know, my Instagram handle was bullfrog because Jeremiah was a bullfrog. And and I was like, oh my gosh, Mossy Oak, I've been wearing your camo since, you know, 88, 89. Like, heck yeah, you can share it. And from there, like, they were asking for more recipes, more pictures. And I was like, man, I, I literally don't care. Like, it's, it's, I'm literally, it's like, I think it was iPhone 4 pictures in my, in my, you know, in my, what you see most people doing with that yellow light. And you're like, oh, wow. And so it was never, 
really classically anything. I would go to the restaurant and I would cook wild game for my servers, bartenders, other managers, back of the house. You know, we'd go fishing. I'd get a big old huge white sea bass and I'd bring in the whole carcass after cleaning it. We'd throw it in a pot and make a big, you know, fish stew for everybody. And so cooking has always been a passion of mine, but never ever thought about it. And the more it started snowballing, the more people started looking at it, the more people started asking questions, the more people started wanting to do it. I was like, you know what? This is, you know, 2013 now, 2014. Uh, I was like, I'm going to start a blog because that's when blogs became real big, right? I'm like, I'm going to start a blog. And I went on there and I just started, I was like, I'm just going to tell hunting stories and throw up a couple of recipes. And so I was like, man, I need a, I need a name for the blog. And so we're sitting there doing something. And my buddy's like, hey, uh, can you do this? Can you do that? And I was like, dude. I was like, man, I just go from field to plate and that's it. I don't, I'm not fancy. I'm not, and I was like from field to plate. Well, that's a pretty good podcast or, you know, pretty good blog name. So from field to plate on, oh, it's hey, look, it's, it's an available domain name. Click it. I'm good to go. And it kind of, that was just where the name stuck was how to, how to go from the field to the plate. Nobody else's hands, but you was the whole tagline. And I wrote my first blog post, which was about my daughter. She was four years old, took her on her first dove hunt. And she sat in the you know field crying, holding this dove. And I'm like, oh, great. You know, I created a vegan like this. This is how vegans are made. And um, then she looked at me. She's like, well, we're going to eat it, right? I'm like, yeah, we're going to eat it. And she's like, okay, well, we need to shoot a lot more then because this isn't enough. Oh, save. Nice. And it like it snapped in her head and it, she got it. And I wrote this long blog post and it went insanely viral. I think oh, the first week it had like 250 million pe- people reading it. And I'm like, dude, that isn't. So then more people started going and then people were like, well, did you have that dove recipe you talked about? You, you, you made a teriyaki dove. So I just literally put a crappy picture of a teriyaki dove that I cooked and people started clicking on it and liking it. And man, this is all right. Well, keep going, keep going. And then finally in 2016 is when it kind of got to its peak. I started selling recipes to magazines and I'm like, this is, this is a lot, a lot cooler than it should be. Um, and a lot more fun and the restaurant industry was getting more boring and more boring and more boring because I was doing cooler and cooler things outside of the restaurant. Um, and then I realized that I was spending like 14, 15, 16 hours a day at the restaurant. I'm like, this is, I can't spend any time with my family. can't spend any time hunting, fishing. Um, but I still didn't have money to quit. Right. When you're sitting there making the bucks as a, as a manager, there's no way you can just drop out. Um, and we were sitting in church and the pastor at the time was talking about this sermon series called cannonballing, where it was how if you dive into a pool, everyone's like, oh, just dive into it, dive into that. When you dive into a pool, the only person you impact is yourself, right? The goal of a dive is to dive in and not make a splash. It's to go in perfect. And everyone always tries to go in perfect and they fail. If you, your feet go left, right, whatever, you're going to fail. No matter what, you're going to fail. Very, very few people can do a perfect dive. He goes, instead, I, I encourage you guys to cannonball. Because when you cannonball, you, you impact everybody in the pool and half the people outside the pool. Your splash goes all the way there and comes all the way back to you. And you can, f- you, know, you can feel that in the pool and the waves splash over. And He goes, but when you cannonball, you got to commit. Otherwise, you're going to hurt your back, your stomach, you're going to belly flop, you're going to back flop. And I remember going, wow, that was a pretty legit sermon. Most of the time, you're, he's like, you know, don't be like Abraham. And... So I'm like, all right. Well, then he walks up to me. He says, Jeremiah, I don't know why, but that, I, was, I was talking to you. I'm like, we have 5,000 people sitting in service right now, and you're talking to me. Thanks, Bruce. Um, <laughs> and so we went home that night. I'm telling my wife, and she's like, yeah. She's like, I always kept thinking, like, you need a cannonball. You need a cannonball. I was like, yeah, but I can't. I can't walk away from the money. And that Wednesday, we had a high school group that I volunteered for as a leader. And we went to run to do something with a bunch of the kids and I had a class four tear in my calf muscle. So my calf shot all the way up to the back of my, my kneecap. And this was July 16th of 2016. And I remember I hit the ground and it felt like someone hit me with a baseball bat, go in, get all the surgeries, get everything you need to get done. They're like, you're out of work for six to nine months. And I went, say what? And so in that six to nine months, I just put everything I had into from field to plate. Man, just, serendipity just dumped it I cannonball mean, I, yeah yeah cannonball i mean that's amazing and then it came time for me to go back to work and i remember looking at my wife and she's like you have not been this happy i mean we've been together since we we're 17 years old you know high school sweethearts she's like i've never seen you this happy 
as you are doing your recipes, writing stories, writing, you know, talking to people on social media. So I switched over to from field to plate on my social media. I remember I was so excited. I had like 2000 followers. I was like, yes, like I am the man. And I walked in and quit my job and they were like throwing more money at me. And I was like, I can't like, there's something about me that says I have to do this. My wife goes, I'll, I'll give you two years. We have enough in our savings and my salary to get us through for two years. If you can't start making money in two years, then go back to the restaurant. You've been there since you were 17 years old. Who cares? They'll, any restaurant will take you. They'll bring you back. Um, yeah. Yeah. No matter what you're like, Hey, I had 18 years of management experience. Like, yep, come on in. Here's a badge. Here's a number. Get in there, start firing people. And so, you know, it's now 2022. I'm now making more money than I was in the restaurant. My family's happy. I travel, you know, I take my summers off to be with my family when my girls are out of school. And then, you know, starting Wednesday, I head to Wyoming and then I'm pretty much gung ho until January, but it's what my wife and I have figured out. And we, it's, it's amazing to see the growth when it's just, you just literally cannonballed into it. And I was like, okay, I'm done. And now it's this, and everyone always said, well, what's your next goal? What's your next? I, I didn't have a goal. There was no goal. Like I have no desire to become famous. I have no desire to have my face up on TV. I have no desire to have my face, you know, plastered all over magazines. I, I don't. I have, I, there's, it's, go for it. I think a key part of that story though, is your wife being so supportive and, and uh, allowing for that risk to, to take place. Cause you know, that's the, I've started the business and it's, and it's, do, you know, it's doing well now. And, but there was a time when it was risky and, and I needed, everybody had to buy in in my family. You know, we had, we had to sort of make that shift and, and it was tough times and we, but we made it happen, you know? And, and I think that's a, that's a really important key is that your wife was like, seemed like she was all in on the subject at the time. Yeah. And I think that's where you kind of look at is, is if you're not a cohesive family unit, because at the time, my daughter, you know, I, I had a, what, three-year-old and a six-year-old. Mm -hmm. So for them, it was like, hey, we might be eating macaroni and cheese. And, and Yay! And they were like, sweet, <laughs> you know? I'd be going to Costco and get a big old thing of dino nuggies. But we're going to, you know, and my father-in-law always told me, because, you know, he's, he's a very well-off man, but he struggled when the, the kids were younger. He said, always struggle when the kids are younger because they won't remember it. So if you're going to do something, do it when they're young and, and be poor when they're young, be, be innovative when they're young, because when they get older, you're going to want, they're going to remember, Hey, we were poor. My friends had this and we didn't, um, he goes, but when they're younger, it's, it's fun. It's exciting that you guys are, you know, making pizzas at home instead of buying pizzas. Like there's this excitement level. And then you also teach your kids that it's not about money. Like, like, like my kids now, they're more extreme budgeters than my wife and I. Like we went out to go do something the other day and my oldest who is 12, she goes, well, is it in the budget? Like I was looking over numbers and we're like, if we're going out to dinner, it's in the budget. Like, don't worry about it. But like, we're at, <laughs> as, as a family now, we're, we're, you know, they have their 10, 10, 80, you know, 10% to church, 10% to savings, 80% they can spend on whatever they want. So any money, even birthday money, they're sitting there, they're divvying out their, their, their allowances to savings. And, and it's like every dollar counts aspect of it. And it's, it's cool because their friends are just blowing money. You know, my oldest created her own earring making company and she's turned around selling earrings at school for five to $10 and a set of earrings. And she's like, well, I just want to make more money and I'm really good at art. So I was like, sweet, you know, I'll, I'll front you the $40 to buy all your product, but just know. So, you know, she, once she made her $50, she's like, Hey, here's 40. Cause now I got 10 to, and it's like, she learned how to pay off her debt. She learned how to pay off all this other stuff. And it's, no interest there, dad. No, I mean, you know, the, the bank of dad is, is interest free. I mean, at right now it's what, like seven, eight percent. I could have made a killing off of that. Could have made like 37 cents, but I mean, but it's, it's fun. It's a it's lot fun. of mac and cheese. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's fun to see the whole family understand it and the whole family get it, you know? And it's even like my father-in-law, even recently, I remember he called me up a couple months ago, back in April. He goes, Hey dude, um, you ever Googled yourself? I was like, no, why? He's like, I just Googled you. Do you know like the first 10 pages are you? And I was like, no, I don't really. He's like, I didn't, I, I knew you did this, but I didn't know you did this. Like he, he still views me as a son-in-law. He goes, I had no idea that you were on so many of this and so many of that. And you've been on TV. I was like, yeah, where did you, where do you think I went all of October last year? You just thought I just, he's like, well, you, you were just doing work. Cause he traveled a lot for work. So he just assumed like, he goes, I had no idea you were filming a, 
you know, a film in Mexico on, on turkeys. And I was like, yeah, I, that's why you watched my kids for three weeks. Like, <laughs> but it's, 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 it's cool validation though. Right. And it's, but it's, it's awesome that it's, you know, and we'll get people at church or I was actually, we went to a local water park yesterday uh, with my brother's family. Cause it was the last day this water park was open. We're like, you know, what, let's go. Let's have fun. We have, we have free passes. And we're waiting in line. This dude's like, uh, Tasha Schiller. I really like that uh, video that you put up on Instagram. I turn around. I'm like, what? Like in the water park here in Southern California, this dude's like, dude, that, uh, that shooting the turkeys with an air rifle. Like I really want to get, and my wife's like, do you know that guy? I was like, nope, never met him before in my life, honey. I'm sitting here in my bathing suit, no shirt on, ready to go down a slide. This dude's like, hey, I really, really liked it. And so it my daughter- It was a clean shot. It was yeah, nice. You know, yeah. It was a, yeah. Um, so, but it's just, it's fun to kind of see that, that progression and to see people actually like understanding and realizing that I am who I am and I'm not going to change because, you know, I've been offered a ton of TV shows and a ton of money from big companies. I'm like, nah, I don't care. Like, if you want to take away the essence of who I am, it's peace. I'm like, I, I've been poor before, I'll be poor again, and it's not going to hinder me. So the money is no longer a driving factor for anything I do. So how are you navigating that, like, and, and choosing which companies you kind of work with? Because um, and maybe you can kind of tell us, I, I, I assume you have some kind of sponsorships. There's some companies I know you worked with, uh, uh, you know, NWTF, and there's some things that you've done, whether maybe it's at, at some of their conferences or special cooking video sessions and things. Sounds like you got this other video. I know you're working on a cookbook. How are, you know, how are you dividing all that time? And when they approach you, which ones are you deciding to go with and why? Yeah, I've got a really different take when a lot of companies approach me. Um, I get approached probably daily from every outdoor, indoor cooking company you can think of. Mm -hmm. And my whole thing is uh, I have, I have a motto that I started and it's really paid out well. It's for the six months, for the first six months, we're building a relationship. I'm not going to ask you for a dime, which blows a lot of people away because the very first thing they come to you is like, well, how much does it cost to do this many posts or this many, whatever. And usually people throw out these astronomical numbers and they try to, you know, negotiate. And I always tell them, I'm like, hey, for the first six months, all I need is your product that I can use. If I love your product and I love your company, then we'll talk numbers in six months. If for some reason you don't like the way that I do what I do and I don't like the what you guys do, then in six months, there's no hard feelings. We walk away, we walk away and it's, it's, it's a shake your hand split and we're fine. Um, and a lot of companies at the beginning are like, you don't want any money? I was like, not for six months. Because I can tell you that I'm worth $3,000 a post, but it means absolutely nothing to your brand. But if you start to see what I'm doing for your brand, and then I come to you saying, Hey, I'm worth $3,000 a post. You can go, yes, you are definitely worth $3,000. I'm not saying I'm making $3,000 a post, but all of a sudden there's a validity behind it. Like working in the restaurant industry for so long and hiring tens of thousands of people, everyone comes in and tries to sell themselves. I should have the job because, and they and, and fill in the blank. The people that were the greatest, in my opinion, the people that I hired who are still in the restaurant business, still killing it. The people said, I need this job because what I can do for you in this job is blank. And so I started saying, okay, how can I take that and turn that into a business model? And so it's like, what can I do for you? I don't, I don't care what you can do for me, but what is it that you would love to see me do? What is it? Some things, you know, I'm doing a, I, I work with local cookers, uh, which is a, they do crawfish boils and flat tops. And, and for the classes, they're sponsoring the classes this year. And I remember the girls like, yeah, just do what you can do. I was like, well, no, I'm going to do this, this, this. And she's like, well, I don't care what you're killing it on whatever you do. But I'm like, but I want you to know that this is, these are my goals and these are the goals I'm going to achieve. And she's like, man, it's awesome. But a lot of companies now, when they send over contracts, I take out and resend the contracts where I'm like, I'm not a commercial for you. I look at the brand. I look at who they're supporting. If it's people that I don't agree with or align with, it's an automatic no. I look at their, I ask them for their core values up front. People are like, uh, why do I know our core values? I'm like, cause I have core values. And See I if they hope, match, right? Yeah, and I hope, yeah, and I hope you, if they don't match, then they don't do it. And third, I want to get the product that you want me to in hand. And if I don't like it, I don't like it. And I'm not going to just sell a product because you're going to give me 10 grand. You know, there's a really good friend of mine. She'll just jump from company to company to company to company, 10 grand, 10 grand, 10 grand, 10 grand. At the end of the year, she made a hundred grand but no one's, there's no validity in it. Like I'm still working with the same companies I worked for five, six years because I built a relationship and a family. And I know I can call the owner and be like, Hey, I'm struggling with this. They're like, okay, yeah, I agree. 
And so that's kind of where I look at it, you know. Who are some of those companies that you're you're currently working with or that you forge some relationships and have some ongoing things going going on with there? Yeah, like Moss Yoke's still the number one. You know, they're the first one to to support me. Um, and I've got, you know, Toxie's number on my cell phone that I can call up and talk to. Um, Vortex is another one that really kind of took that that leap of faith before there was anybody, before they were really sponsoring very many people. Mm-hmm. Uh, Traeger was, I was one of their very first wild game people that they got, you know, in there and I'm on their app, I'm their stuff. And so um, that was huge. You know, there's just Hornaday ammo. Um, it's just these, these companies that I continually use because I love them. And then they're like, Hey, you keep using our stuff and we're not paying you. We can start paying you for using our stuff. And like, okay, sure. Let's have a conversation. Let's, and let's, let's figure this out. Uh, I, I like the way you do it just because it, it there's, there is validity. It's pure. It's like, you know, the, the trial period with various companies allows for you to truly figure out, it's just something that I can stand behind. And then can they stand behind me? You know, yeah. like it, it's more, it's almost, I would, I would think from, it's like my clients, like they spread the word about what we do and, I can go out there and try to sell all I want, but what matters is that client of mine who sells for me, you know, and, and I don't, I don't mean that in any particular way other than like, that is your reputation. Yeah. You know, and if these companies believe in you, then that that's the best, to me, that's the best model you can, you can take. Yeah. And I don't reach out to companies, um, which is, which is another way. A lot of these, these influencers, they'll throw out, they'll just send an email, a mass email to 5,000 different ammo companies. I wait for that company to reach out to me because my grandpa used to always tell us when you're, when you're good, you seek the attention of others. When you're great, others seek your attention. And so even looking at all these sports stars and everybody else, there's some good players out there and they're the ones like, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. You know, LeBron James, is he, is he great? I don't think so because of his attitude, MJ. but is he, but is he good? Yeah, he's good, but he's, Hey, look at me. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm the greatest. Ain't I? You know, then you have these other players who are just phenomenal. You know, like look at Steph Curry. The guy's brilliant in basketball and he's not seeking attention. Everyone's seeking his attention and wanting him to be on, you know, he has what, holy moly, a, a miniature golf TV show. Like it's, it's insane to, to look at these people. And that's kind of how I, I run my business, run my lifestyle is there's a million amusement parks, but it, people only usually save up to go to Disneyland. So I want to be the Disneyland. I want to be the best. Um, and I'm not going to go out there and do anything else. This is who I am. This is what I stand for. And if you want to be a part of that, then let's go. If you don't, okay. You know how many, uh, ammo companies there are right now in the world? Like if you don't, if if we're not going to line, then, uh, you know, I'll go shoot Nosler or something else. I'd like to come back to something from earlier. Um, you, you mentioned the restaurant business a few times. What? what was the history there? And then I know it's something you got away from, but it, 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 it is important. It set, it set the stage for being able to um, push out recipes and, and ultimately um, create from field to plate among other things. But I, you know, that, that background I, I would imagine is important. Yeah. I started my, I wanted to become a police officer and uh, went through all the stuff and then found out that I'm colorblind, which being homeschooled, you never really understood it. You just, you know, there was two blue Ninja Turtles. I didn't know there was a purple one. <laughs> and so you couldn't, you, you can't be a police officer and be colorblind. And so then I was like, well, I'll go get into become a youth pastor, get into church Do you know, I was born and raised in, in Christian faith and started looking at the politics behind church. And I'm like, I can't, like, I don't want to lose the love for the faith and the Bible and everything else, because so many people get into politics of the church, it just becomes a job. And you, you really hate the job um, after a while. And so I needed money, 17, couldn't, can't be a cop. So I was like, well, I'm just gonna get a job at a restaurant because it'll pay through, it'll pay college. And it just kind of stuck. I really fell in love with talking to new people every single day. Um, and seeing how the back of the house and front of the house ran, I was always food was such a huge part of my family growing up. You know, mom was always cooking. We never ate out. Mom was cooking. Grandpa was a pit master in barbecue. My dad was a phenomenal barbecuer. Um, we would go over to my grandma's house on Tuesdays and Sundays for giant feasts with all the, you know, siblings and 
cousins and aunts and uncles. And so food was always part of who I was as a, as a person. So getting in the restaurant business and realizing you can do this. And then um, the company I was working for had a contest, like create your own burger. And out of everyone in the, all, in the whole chain. And so I remember like, I can do this. So I created my own burger. It became pop. It's still on the menu today. Um, and then I started realizing, well, I really like the back of the house more than the front of the house, but I don't speak Spanish. And a lot of, you know, California and even Texas, or Texas, it's, no. it's, it's all Hispanics in the back, unless you're in Brownsville. And then if you're in Brownsville, it's the Hispanics in the front and all the white guys in the back. I opened up a restaurant in Brownsville uh, for the company. And I remember we got there, we were all front of the house trainers and no one in the front of the house spoke in, any English. We're like, what? They're like, oh, all the, all the white guys are in the kitchen. We're like, <laughs> walk in the kitchen. It's all the guys. What's up, dude? Yeah, yeah man. Like Corpus Christi. And <laughs> we're like, all right, cool. Let's have some fun. So we had to like switch roles. We had to teach all of our back of the house guys how to be servers, bartenders, cocktailers. And they had to teach us how to go be in the back and be like hot side, cold side prep cooks. And then we had to teach all these white guys how to do a stuff. So it was a lot of fun, but it just kind of progressed. And then I got into uh, management when I was 21. As soon as I could, I was like, all right, get me into management. I opened, I was the youngest GM for the company at like 22 years old. And then decided that I wanted to get into like corporate development and restaurant idea training. So I started writing training programs for the book or for the company because I started looking at the way that servers and bartenders and cocktailers and back of the house were doing their jobs. And like, you can do it a lot better, more effectively and more efficiently. And so really understood the training. So training has always been part of who I am, I guess. You can look back all the way back in the past. And so I would take these servers and be like, okay, this is what it is. You know, you, you, you've heard of secret shoppers. Well, I created a thing called the GMC's guest experience or GEC guest experience checklist, which I took all the things that were on the secret shopper list. And I said, okay, as servers, you're going to sit down one whole shift and you're going to watch your other servers and you're going to grade them. And what it did is it started realizing the servers going, oh my gosh, I do the same thing they're doing and I have to check them off. And next thing you know, we went from in my restaurant, we went from like a, a 68% secret shopper to hundred percent secret shopper. We started, we went from a three star on Yelp to a five star on Yelp. And all the whole, the whole company is going, what are you doing differently? I'm like, well, I'm training my servers and bartenders differently. Not the way you're, you're training them, but this is my style of training. And they're like, okay, well, can we buy the, the, the program off you? Like, yeah, sure. Here you go. And started doing it for many companies. You know, you look at cheesecake factory. I helped write, write and develop theirs. Uh, California pizza kitchen, red Robin, um, some of these Landry's restaurants that you guys have, um, I helped write mm -hmm. their training programs because it was effective and efficient. And so that really kind of how the restaurant industry went with me was starting off and realizing it could be better. And just how can I make it better all the way up? And then I was like, well, all right, now how can I take my career and make hunters and anglers and cooks, home cooks better? And I guess that's kind of the same path I'm taking is how can I get to the top of that path? And then the knowledge for food did that, that was that was just being restaurant adjacent right like you were you were just in there and, and back of the house and like learning different techniques and all that stuff that was the that was sort of the culinary training it sounds like yeah the, there was never i was never officially culinary trained um but through the restaurant i'd go in the back you, you have to be culinary trained to be a manager you have to know how to make every menu item because if you're on a slow day or a busy day you'd jump back there if if your hot if your hot side guy gets sick, you got to know, know how to make every single steak. Uh, if your cold side gets, you need to know how, how to make every salad, every sandwich. So you understood how to read a recipe, write a recipe, develop a recipe, make sure you know portion controls, pictures, photography, all that stuff really kind of plays a role in it. Um, and so yeah, there was that the basis of that. But again, growing up in a family where you were forced to cook with mom and dad and grandpa and grandma. And there was no ifs, ands, or buts. And so it kind of just progressed into something that was better and something that you can kind of, you know, progress to. But I've always been an artist, art in the form of sculpting, painting, drawing. And so for me, food became my new medium. Um, and if you look at my photography now or my videos, you can see that that's my new medium is how can I make and present food that looks as good as it tastes. Cause you can go to McDonald's to see a big Mac, but that big Mac looks like nothing you've ever seen before when you open up that box. And so how can I teach you to do what I'm doing in, and do it? So I, I, I actually sketch out everything, every recipe before I even create it in my head on a, on a sketchbook. I write down all the ingredients, what I think it'll taste like. 
And then my goal is to take that picture and translate it into, or that drawing and translate it into an actual work of art and piece of food that my wife gets to eat. Cause every, every plate you see is my wife's food. Um, so it'd be, it'd be cool if those sketches like in a cookbook under each like page number, if there was a little, like the original sketch, you know, graphically that was just, like associated someone, with that. Someone told me, I just need, I just need to publish that. Cause I've got like three of those books. Like just publish that people would go cool. crazy seeing just your, and where I marked out or where there's like, you know, where I'm opening it up because I'm cooking it and there's drips from the soy sauce or the whatever all over it. And it's just, it's real and raw. And, and it's also listening to people. Like I develop recipes by listening to people in an airport, um, hearing two people talk about their favorite food. And then I'll grab out my little notebook and start jotting down ideas. Cause I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, okay. Or sitting there and talking to a little kid. They're like, Oh, my favorite thing in the world is blank. I'm like, how can I recreate that? And how can I make it better? And how can I take out all the preservatives? to make it a fresh, beautiful flavored food that still resembles that to that kid or my kid. And so food is always on my mind. It's always, it's always there. And it's my, my wife, I was told, Oh, you're so lucky. She's like, yeah, but we don't have the same meals. Like you guys do all the time. Like, it's not like we don't have taco Tuesday. It's taco Tuesday, but it's 14 different tacos in, you know, in two months. She's like, which is great. But sometimes I just want a normal taco, you know, like, and so and my kids are the same way. Like they're kind of like, this is completely honest. Whenever I make a new dish, my daughters act like they're restaurant critics. This is, they get out a piece of paper. They look at the food, they critique the food. They're like, okay, well, dad, I think that, okay, well, hmm, June, what do you More think? sugar. Yeah. I think, I, I think it needs, to, it needs something. It needs, it needs a kick. There needs to be some acidity, dad. And I'm like, shut up. Eat your freaking cheese, you know, your macaroni and cheese. Um, there's no acidity in macaroni and cheese, just deal with it. And, but their minds are different now. And I think it really encourages me to, to push forward. Um, but like, I've got up to like antelope hunting. I'm already thinking about like the six or seven different dishes that are rolling through my head, but who knows those dishes, all of a sudden I shoot that animal and something brand new pops in my head or I start gutting and I start smelling something I'm like, Oh, sage, rosemary. Okay. Well, I'm gonna make a rosemary and sage sausage. Dang it. It's not what I want to make with it. Yeah, no, Jeremiah, that's what we, I mean, I could speak for George on this subject. That's what we do. We, um, like we're our big hunts in December and we're already going through various cookbooks or looking at your website, you know, um, and, and thinking about ahead of time, how does that lead to the way I'm going to butcher something and what recipes are we going to try? You know, cause we're, we're cooks, we're not chefs, but we're in it enough to where we do understand butchery to a certain level, you know? And so um, I like hearing you say that you've already got things in your head before the critter is even before the hunt even begins, you know, right. that was going to be a question too. Is like, how do you, you know, uh, depending on what's coming down the pipeline in terms of what you're creating um, you um, now I can imagine you're probably already have the animal strung up in your mind and you're, and you're seeing what you're going to butcher or take away from that particular um, hunt, et cetera. Um, what is the, um, what is the one, do you have any that are coming up right now that you're already starting to think about? Hunt wise. Oh, I got Yeah. It. Yeah. Hunt wise and recipes or not to get into recipes that may come down the pipeline that you want to, uh, hold off on in terms of talking about, but like, what are some of the critters that you're going after that you can, you're thinking about already in this? Yeah. I mean, my phone is keep, keeps blowing up from I'm heading to Wyoming in, on Wednesday to go hunt antelope. And so the guy who, whose property that I hunt on is already texting me like, Oh, what's for dinner? Cause that's part of my, my fee to him. It literally that's what he's texting right now. I'm like, I'm on a podcast. He's like, yeah, but I need to plan dinner for Sunday night. <laughs> and so um, it's, for me, I mean, I've got antelope coming up. I have whitetail. Um, I got quail coming up. Second dove season coming up. Waterfowl season starts here on the 23rd in our, on, on our zone uh, of October. We've got access lined up, you know, fall turkey, you name it. Like my, it's, it's going to be a crazy fall. Literally, I was, like I told you, I'm, I leave on Wednesday and I'm gone until next Wednesday. I come home for a couple of days. Then I go to Texas or they actually go to like on the border of Arizona and California to go hunt mule deer archery with, with a new archery hunter. And then from there, I'm driving straight to Texas to go do my classes. Then I come home for like two weeks. Then I go to Buffalo, New York to go hunt whitetail up there. Uh, and then, by, and then, and then I'm coming home and it's like right into upland game and bird season here, which I'll be out doing a ton of. 
And then December, I'm going back to Texas because I've got really cool something special coming out. And so I'm doing three days at this ranch where it's just me and some photographers and, you know, two brothers, the Gill brothers hunting. And our goal is to shoot a lot of deer um, for some really cool videos and kind of some books coming up. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's going to be an intense, an intense fall and early, you know, winter. So in other words, there's a lot of recipes swirling around in your mind right now. Probably. I have, I have a, uh, so I have journals with all recipes, right? I have yeah. like, I think 250 recipes I haven't even made yet. Um, and wow. I still am at like last night I, was, I woke up in the middle of the night and I was like, Oh, I have an idea for a, a sauce. And I, I have a journal next to my bed, jot down the idea and then go back to sleep. And today I'll sit there and work, work on the idea, but there's things that ideas that have come to my head that I think sound really cool and really beautiful. And I write them down and it's been, you know, it might, it might take me a year or two years to get to it, but it's, I want to have that idea there because there's, there's this old saying that there's no new recipe, just, you know, versions of recipes. And I think that is true to an extent because every steak has been done. Um, but it's how can you make that steak different than the steaks that have been done before? And so you might be able to elevate a recipe or whatever, but yeah, it's really, really fun to sit there and look at a piece of meat and just imagine it and to really kind of use your imagination to what that can become. Uh, because I think people get so caught up in tacos, chili poppers, fried. Oh, look, there's my, you know, jerky. Oh, look there or spaghetti, you name it. Right. They get so caught up in just the basic five is what I call it, that you get lost in utilizing meat as meat. And for me, I don't have the option to, to eat it with a steak. My steak has to come from a critter. And so it's not like I have the option to go and just eat domesticated animals. Like I have to be creative and I have to, if I want to eat that, it has to come from a locally sourced or naturally sourced ingredient, you know? Well, and, and when you were kind of talking a little bit earlier, it reminded me when you were saying, you know, kind of the, the things that maybe we are familiar with. I, I know you mentioned like Big Mac. Well, I, I know on your on your website too, and I've seen some posts like you create a venison burger yeah, but that is like the Big Mac. Like there's some things that you've created on your site that um, those in, in, in the world of like non-hunting, they'll be like, Oh, I've had that at this place. I've had it at this place. This looks like something I've ordered from, you know, a Shazwan Chinese restaurant or whatever it is like that. There's some familiarity in, in looks or even maybe in, you know, similar tastes, like something like that, that, that Big Mac that um, kind of brings people a familiarity to them. And, and then that association with the wild game, because I think, like you said, to those big five, a lot of folks that say, oh, I just I take it to the process and I get a ground or I get this sausage. And maybe they're afraid to go ahead and, and try to cook something on their own. I mean, I, I know a lot of folks that I've gotten in, they, they can get in, I, we've helped them to get to be butchering animals, and then they're taken apart, maybe they're saving their their back straps, tenderloins off to the side, they're taking their quarters, maybe out to get processed. And that's good and fine, you know, whatever it is they, they like. But taking that next step to then, okay, we're going to cut a, this little muscle group, and we're going to try this. And I, I feel like you have tons of inspiration on, on your website, or even if you want to create something that you know, is familiar to something you've had before, maybe in one of the takeout restaurant type places. But like, let's walk through, for instance, like you're saying, you got antelope here next week. When you're taking that antelope, what are some of the cuts that you're taking out that maybe let's say you got somebody with you that it's their first time, you know, hunter or, or you know, they're just getting into the game. Like you're like, okay, here's how we're going to make this steak or something here that's maybe something simple that's kind of like a, a 101 kind of getting them into that because i know in your classes i'm sure you're you as you're butchering we'll talk about that a little bit later on you're walking them through this process but kind of that entry level meal because you know, we're doing this series wild game wednesday you're our second you know chef that we're working with we're gonna have more too and i'm, I'm really hoping to inspire people who have maybe you know okay i got this animal on the ground now what do i do with it what are some kind of you know, those one oh ones, those those simple first things that you're suggesting they can do that are kind of on more on a basic side of things. Yeah. One of the biggest things I teach a lot of new hunters in the very beginning is to keep your muscle groups whole. Uh once they're cut, they're cut. Um, and so if you automatically cut all your steaks off of your sirloin or your bottom round or your top round, steaks are steaks. 
Um, you can grind them, you can make them thinner, but you can't make a roast out of them and you can't make, you know, and so what I try to encourage people to do is, is to keep these, these muscle groups whole. So to take the, now, unless you're shooting an elk then and, and that sirloin tip is, you know, 43 pounds. Um, but when you're shooting a white tail and it's the size of a football, it's not that much. Um, and yeah, you can cut your six steaks out of it and then have your two little tips that go into the ground pile. But if you're to keep that roast whole and you want steaks, guess what? You pull it out, you slice it, you got steaks. But if you're sitting there going, man, I really want to try a recipe. You know, I, w- I want to try a Mississippi pot roast with this, um, but I don't have any roast left. You can throw those steaks in. They're still going to give you a very similar product, but you're not going to get as long of the green structure for that pulled type aspect of, of a meal you want. So that's number one is really keeping those meat, gr- those, those whole cuts whole. Also from learning from a lot of these old butchery stuff, it's going to, the less surface space on the meat, the less chance of freezer burn and rot. And so if you're sitting there slicing these steaks and laying them out, you now have, you know, double the surface area on some of these cuts that have a chance to get freezer burned or to get, you know, an odd flavor versus say you get a little bit of, you know, frost on one side, you can trim that off. You now still have this this beautiful roast and these cuts. So that's, that's the biggest, I think, thing I tell people. It's like, hey, keep it whole. Well, I really want, I'm going to grind the whole thing. Well, here's some ideas you can do w- without grinding it. Well, I always turn this chuck into, into jerky. Okay, well, this cut actually sucks for jerky. You know which one is really good for jerky? This one. So this one, these are some really cool things. And there was a lady that I was teaching one time, and she literally took a slab of duct tape and put it on her vacuum seal bag and wrote down, like had me write, give her like four or five different ideas for meals. So that way when she pulled it out, she could look at it going, okay, I can cook this, 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 or this with this cut of meat. And so it was kind of really refreshing to see someone really listen to that a lot. Cause a lot of guys, I, I don't care who you are. If you, you come to my class, you're like, oh yeah, I want to learn. And then you're like, nope, I just get jerky and ground. You're like, okay, well, the whole idea was for me to teach you how beautiful this animal is on the inside. And so yeah, that's, I think that's the big one is keep those primals whole um, because it's really, it's really fun to be able to pull that out and go, okay, I can do this because you can then grind it. You can then sausage it. You can then slice it, but you can also roast it. So I like that advice a lot. I mean, this yeah. weekend I pulled out a hind quarter from a doe and um, basically got down to a little bit of grind pile, um, the sirloin tip, the eye of the round, the top round and the bottom round. And now it's, it's up for grabs. Like what's next, you know, it's like, well, I have these, these different cuts that, you know, can ultimately do what I need to do with, uh, like recently I was listening to watching, um, Danielle Pruitt's, uh, channel. And she was mentioning with the top round slicing it right, like right through the middle section and then quick sear on both sides. And now you have really good fajita cut, you know? And like, I never really saw that muscle that way. Um, and so, uh, I think, is there, uh, yeah, cause there's a better one to use for which one. Yeah. No, let's hear it. Let's hear it. Yeah. Hey, Danielle, I love you to death. You know, I talk to you all the time, but, uh, yeah. Uh, so if you're actually using that top round mm-hmm. is going to, it's going to have more of the grain structure of a it's the, the long grain is what you're, you're, you're referring have, you're to, right? Very, yeah. very long yeah. grain. And so there's yeah. a technique from back in the 1700s called feathering. Mm-hmm. Google it. You ain't going to find it. Um, and what I started doing with, uh, turkey breasts, chicken breasts, you name it, any type of breast was it, that's what this feathering technique was for, was for poultry. And so we were at deer camp and I was like, huh, I wonder how feathering would affect venison because it's a different structure. Well, I realized that, 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 that round had the same grain structure as a wild turkey breast, long, thin mm-hmm. grain structure. So, okay, so if I can utilize the same feathering technique as I did on the large turkey breast, which is similar to similar size and shape. And so what we did is we feathered this, this roast out and it was, I don't think you could tell the difference from a slab of beef flank steak shredded, you know, side steaks that you're going to make for, for your fajitas versus this round that now held this beautiful texture. It absorbed all the marinade and it wasn't thick, right? Cause even if you take that cut that Danielle's telling you, you're still going to get a thick, you're still going to get a, a quarter inch to a half inch cut. Even if you're cutting that sucker down the middle. And the problem with cutting stuff down the middle is you're actually, you're actually toughening and breaking the, um, 
the actual strands of that meat itself. So you're, you're having it do an unnatural thing. You're actually having it fight against itself. So even if you were to take a, a chicken breast and slice that chicken breast open and open it up, you're actually negatively cutting those grains. You're actually telling the animal that it's injured. Meat still has the, the meat itself still has a memory. And this is stuff that I've researched. This isn't what I'm learning in books. This is what I've researched from I mean, last year. I butchered 350 deer. Like mm-hmm. I, I, I know how meat works. And what happens is the meat starts to fight against itself. And so by slicing something down the middle and opening it up, what you're actually doing is you're creating two smaller pieces of tougher cut of meat. I don't, I don't, you can fight me all day long. Anybody who wants to fight me, we'll have a cook off. You cut it your way. I'll cook it my, I'll I'll cut it my way. And is there a right way or a wrong way to do stuff? No, anybody can do it. I think there's better ways of doing things, but I'm never going to like right, right or wrong. No, there's, there's better. My, I've found ways that are better for the cuts of meat and the recipes that I want to develop. And that sometimes makes it where I got a whole pile full of meatballs at the end because it didn't work. But there's a lot of times where it works and I go, oh, great. But you take that open and you, you butter. So pretty much what f- feathering is, is you're going to take a super, super sharp knife. You're going to cut down to the, the, the depth you want. So say you want one eighth of an inch. And instead of continually cutting, you're going to push one way and do a back and forth sawing in a sense motion, and you're going to push the meat. What that's actually doing is it's making a bunch of micro abrasion, micro cuts on that meat. And it's actually pushing the meat itself out and creating a longer, bigger chunk of flatter meat. So you mm-hmm. could take a chicken breast that's this big, cut it in half. Like you want a butterfly, it, open it up and you now have two hand sizes, right? Cause that's, it's the same thing. Well, can, can we use the, um, the top round as the example? So the, the long fibers are running, you're going to go um, with the fibers. So you're, yeah. So the, the, the knife's going to run the long yep. direction. Yeah. And, and so you're going an eighth quarter inch down and then you're pushing the meat off to the side. Yep. And, and I'm then, actually, I'm, I have a whole video series coming out on how to do this. Um, we did it with, we did it with every single cut we could. Uh, the top and the back strap worked out, the back strap worked out phenomenal bet, um, yeah. with this as well, because it has that same, it's grain structure goes the opposite way. But when you mm-hmm. flayed it open, it opened it up this way where the grain actually went a lot longer than what you're thinking, even though the grains run um, left to right and it made it open up a, right, uh, a top to bottom. But it's, it's brilliant because it's taking old world technology of a super sharp knife and a long blade. So I'm talking like a 10 inch scimitar blade that has a nice curve on it where you can get that, that straight back and forth, not like a, you know, a, a, a six inch chef knife, you're going to be doing a lot more work. That's like, I see these guys out there trying to hack up an elk with a little Havilon blade. Mm-hmm. I go, you're making it so much harder than it needs to be. Get yourself a blade, freaking cut that animal. And, and that's just for me learning from these butchers who pulled out, you know, 10 inch scimitars. They're like, okay, you pull out this blade, you're going to get cuts that aren't beautiful, not straight. You pull out this blade, sort of that, you know, that Crocodile Dundee. That's not yeah. a knife. That's, that's, a, knife. A, that's a knife. <laughs> and so you make these cuts, you know. So so if, if I go down the back strap with, with, with my 10-inch scimitar, I make one long straight cut and you pull that back strap off. It's beautiful and gorgeous. Versus you see ones that are all notch, 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 all the way down because you're using this little two-inch blade. Yeah. Now, if that's all you have, instead of stabbing it in, do lengthwise and do these long straight cuts with that little blade. It's still doable. But, Work it against the, the, the right. bone there. Right. Yeah, and, no. for, and for me, sort of going back to what you were saying of making this food presentable to non hunters, that's my whole goal is, is I want this food to look like something that they have eaten before. The reason I make these little bitty T-bones isn't is like, oh, look, I made a little T-bone. It's because when I put that on someone's plate, they're like, oh, it's a T-bone. Yeah. Now it's only the size of my palm because it came off a little antelope, but it's a T-bone. The reason that, you know, I started doing the Frenched out uh, backstraps. I got made fun of by all these chefs who are now doing it. Like I, I have emails of all these chefs, like you're an idiot. You're stupid. Now they're like, look at this French out venison backstrap. And I go, remember when you made fun of me for that? Because you said it was, it was pointless and it was over. It was too much work. And, but then people started realizing that it looked like a tomahawk and it got people excited to eat little lollipops and it got, so what I'm talking about French out is you take the backstrap, you leave yeah. the, you leave the, the, eight, the rib, the, right. the eight bone ribs, cut down the rib, five mm-hmm. inches, trim the, you know, French out the, bone, which means you take off all the meat and leave it nice and white. Um, I posted a thing on my Instagram today. You can go look at, but there's this mentality of getting people excited to eat it and not just, Oh, it's, you know, Oh, it's venison. It's gamey. 
like em- embrace the gamey and teach people that it's that it, it it can be different and that different isn't bad. But I think gamey has such a negative con, you know, attachment to it that I'm like, embrace it. Talk about how gamey this, this, this is such a delicious gamey flavor and explain why. After this, I need to send you a picture. Uh, one year I made a, the coat of arms, you know, mm. where, where the ribs cross. Yeah. That was fun. It was a, it turned out to be a gift for um, my father-in-law, but, uh, but yeah, I think um, if you, if we can just go back real quick to the, um, to the hind quarter, um, uh, that's, I mean, that sounds like a really awesome technique with the top round and kind of getting it spread out. And, um, and if the, if the desire was fajitas, et cetera. Um, one of the, one of the things we were going to ask you is um, we have some particular items in our freezer and um this is something that we like to ask various chefs uh one of them was the hind leg sirloin tip just off the cuff what is something that you like to do with that uh i think sirloin tip like we were talking about um because that is that's gonna be your if a lot of people are like what's a sirloin tip that's one that that looks like a football Mm -hmm. the ball roast or whatever um and so it's a lot easier for people to understand but yes it is that is that sirloin that sirloin tip and that's where you get a little tri-tip on top the little little point on top of it but i think for me i love i know a lot of people will fight me on it but i think that's one of the best ones for steaks um it really holds true to it and there's actually four muscles part of that one muscle group itself so if you were to take that and do a cross cut you'll actually see there's two little lobes on each side and there's a bigger muscle running down the middle and what do you actually have you actually have um the sciatic nerve will actually run part of the inside of that. So you can actually take off that little middle part and you'll be left with a larger steak with two little smaller steaks on, on that side. It tends to be a tender cut if you take the time to marinate it properly and cook it at the right temperatures. It's one of my favorites. That's also a good one to throw in if you're doing any roast. So if you want a pot roast, if you want a Mississippi roast, if you want roast and potatoes, that is a great one. It holds up really, really well. It actually forms itself into a roast. It doesn't really fall apart. Um, and there is this myth that that whole top part of that is all silver skin. It's not. Um, so a lot of, you'll see, I'll see a lot of guys that trim and trim and trim and trim and trim off so much of that meat. That is all just a fascia that will burn off. Um, the only silver skin you're going to find is on the lower bottom part of it, uh, where it actually attaches to the uh, upper leg bone, thigh bone, uh, up near the H bone area. That's really the only area you're going to find but yeah, that whole top sheen on it, it's not silver skin. Stop cutting it off. It'll cook off. One, uh, one of my favorites is like when that, when that, when to cook it like a roast and, and um, bring it to, I like to stop it at 120 and then let it, let it rest. I t- it takes it to about 125, 130. And then I just put it in the refrigerator and then the next day That's slice sweet. it really thin roast. Yeah. A, a kind of venison roast beef. And that one of my favorites i love yeah, that and that's and, and as an irish boy whenever it comes thanksgiving or it comes time for saint patty's day that's what i'm using for my corned beef um because again it holds up beautifully in a in a 14 day brine it's not going to fall apart because of the muscle structure within that and the coarseness of the actual tendons and structure so but yeah that's also one you can use for the, the roast beef cuts that you're doing for your kids lunches um it, it holds up beautifully mm-hmm. um for those and that's that's what I'm saying. Any, anything that you need a whole roast for, that's the whole roast that I'm going to use on a deer if I'm using a whole roast, just because I think it does it does hold up the best out of anything. Next item in our freezer is the squirrel. And mm-hmm. we have a few squirrels. What what comes to the top of your mind? Just the good old squirrel and dumplings. That's my absolute favorite. I think slow cooking, because sometimes you get those squirrels and they're tougher than a door, you know, than a boot leather. And a lot of guys are like, oh, I'm frying squirrel. And they're sitting there, you're sitting there chewing on that squirrel for an hour and a half. And it's like, this is, this is the game. Um, <laughs> I love slow cooking the down and making, like I make squirrel tortilla soup. Using it for a lot of soups and stews is my favorite just because it shreds and tastes. So it, it's a great gateway for a lot of hunters to introduce people to wild game because it tastes a lot similar, very, very similar to a dark meat on chicken, especially when it's cooked down like that. So squirrel and dumplings you know, doing a fajita, some sort of fajita type deal with it, soup. Uh, but yeah, soups and stews are my favorite with squirrels. I think they just, they hold up the best in that and I think I, are, are exciting to eat. Sandhill crane, not breast, but leg. Everyone always gets excited about the ribeye in the sky, the breast, but i um, curious about the leg. What would you do with the leg? Well, I wouldn't just use the leg. I'd use the leg and thigh. Because... Or thigh, but yeah, the whole combo. I agree. Yeah. Um, 
but last sandhill crane hunt we did we made a uh sandhill crane barbacoa out of it so we threw in the legs and thighs like i do with my turkey legs and thighs on some of them and we let that shred down and it dude it was stupid and then we also made like birria tacos with the leftover um aspects of it and they were stupid so i think i mean here's the deal with sandhill crane they're standing all the time in fields or in marshes they fly and then they stand and they eat all day long and so their legs are very 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 tough and so if you're going to sit there and i saw i saw a video of this guy's like oh i'm making um sandhill crane drumsticks and i laughed because i'm like you're just doing that just to do that because he, he took a bite and you could see all the hard tendons and everything. I'm like, no, that's not, I'm telling you, it's not how it works. Pop, pop, pop. Yeah. And I think that's the problem was you get a lot of these guys who are out there trying to shock and awe, look what I can do. And then it turns a lot of people off because they try it and they're like, no, this is gross. I'll never do it again. And so for me, throwing it in that slow cooker and letting it cook down all day long and you walking in after a day of hunting and you smell that and it does very, very similarly resemble beef um but that barbacoa oh man just fresh fresh tortillas a little bit of pico on there and so that's cumin some chili powder some uh yeah chipo- yeah uh, chipotles and adobo uh peppers mm-hmm. onions garlic um using uh like anchote chili paste if you want to go that route or just going to your local mexican grocery store or your heb and getting those dried red Hio chilies, throwing those in there and letting those cook down. Um, it's pretty much just a spicy red, you know, kind of meat on it. Um, Shout out to HEB. Oh, I love it. dude. HEB's <laughs> my favorite part of fall is going during t- like tamale season. So it's like oh, the yeah. fir- first thing I do when I enter Texas is like straight to HEB, get homemade tortillas to to drive and just eat the t- flour tortillas just fresh. Oh, their okay. chicharrones are really good too. I mean, yeah, but I I just love that soft. Oh yeah, yeah. The butter the butter tortillas are probably. And and then right when you walk in front, yes. they got those just those metal crates full of just tamales. And it's like pick one up, grab a bag for ten bucks, and then go to and by, by by the time you get to the ranch, it's like oh crap, I should have got three dozen, not just two dozen, because you've already eaten two dozen of them. So <laughs> yes, um, hog belly, depending on the pig, sow medium, because you're gonna get some that's gonna have thick belly, you're gonna get some that's gonna have thin belly. Um, I've made bacon from sow. Uh, pork belly and then the best thing to do for it though is because it does it is very very thin and a lot of times um if the pig's not eating well it's not going to have especially in texas you're gonna get some pigs that are fatty fat and the other ones you're gonna get there going there's no belly meat even here to save Uh, but what i'll actually do is i'll I'll use that all that for my sausage ground Um, it has it's a beautiful melting fat and so when you put it into your sausages it's awesome a lot of guys will sit there and they'll take the backstrap fat. The problem is that that's more of a coarse fat, which is still usable, but that belly fat is what you want. It's more of that melting type fat. So, or even render that down and use that in cooking for your grease for, you know, those type of aspects. You can take all the belly fat, cube it up, throw it into a crock pot and let it just cook on low and then just keep stirring and draining, stirring and draining, stirring and draining. And you'll get a whole entire, you know, mason jar full of this liquid gold off that off that pork belly and is that you're, you're not quite to lard though right i mean or is that are we getting but if doing you doing that it, process getting closer yeah, to let, lard yeah if you let it solidify okay uh, okay so that yeah, I would, yeah but it, it, it'll last a long time in the fridge mm-hmm. uh, you can put it in there and it'll last and it will solidify it will start to get tougher it's not going to be like you would domesticate a lard just because you're not using all that leg fat and uh inner cavity fat like you're going to find in a lot of lards um, but it does become more of like a bacon fat if you, start, okay. if you think of like that bacon fat where you know where it renders and it's it becomes more of the the harder liquid mm-hmm. uh, that's what you're going to find when you render down that hog belly but i love i literally take it all and that goes into my mid, bajillion different flavors of sausages and stuff that i make so how many the last one is dove so how many dove did you did you guys get this year? Cause your social media was flooded with, with some really cool looking um, uh, videos and, or just Im- imagery of dove hunts, et cetera. Yeah. We, t- we took out 27 hunters um, mm-hmm. to these fields that I have permission to hunt. Uh, I was all cut, cut grain, 
cut wheat and opening day, we shot 437, no, 403 dove is what we shot opening morning. Some 27 hunters. And then total, total three days. I think we shot like 780 dove total three days. So um, a lot of, a lot of choice between what you do with it. What's your, what's your favorite though? Like what's your go-to, what do you love to do with a dove? Well, I pluck every single dove, mm-hmm. uh, which I know a lot of people call me crazy for that. But so again, once it's plucked, you can then breast it and do whatever you want, but you have the option to eat it whole. Sort of like I was saying, keeping those other cuts whole. Um, but for me, it's probably spatchcocked barbecue dove with like dipped in like a, a homemade bourbon barbecue sauce. Um, it's, I season it up easily, you know, just very lightly with S and P garlic powder, uh, onion powder, maybe a little chupacabra. If you're from Texas and you know that stuff, <laughs> use that. It's phenomenal. <clears throat> if not go look at chupacabra on Amazon and buy a bottle of black label. You're going to, it's going to blow your socks off. Um, and then spatchcock it. So I'm cutting out the backbone, cracking that sucker open and then grilling it to about a 125, 130. And then what I do is I actually make a big old thing of bourbon barbecue sauce. And I just hold onto a back leg, dip the whole entire sucker and throw it back on there to kind of caramelize it up. And it is probably the one that goes, goes the farthest, the fastest. Um, but again, you can look on my social media and see that I'm making, you know, dove popper pizzas. I made dove chorizo this year. Um, took, I think we took like a hundred dove and just pulled every piece of meat off. We could threw it through the grinder with some pork belly and we made chorizo and it was phenomenal. Um, so think outside the box, you can grind dove and you can make dove tacos and dove, whatever with this ground. Um, don't, don't think it's just two little breasts. Cause my favorite is taking that leg and thigh and just sucking it off the bone after it's cooked. Like I'll give everyone the breasts all day long. I'm like just, I'll just rip off all the feet and thighs and just sit there. And it's like just one little beautiful little pull off in your mouth. And it's, Oh, it's gorgeous. It's one of my favorite meats. I don't, I'll fight people on it. Dove dove is phenomenal when cooked properly. Absolutely. Oh, thanks for those tips. We'll definitely be uh, checking those out and looking at, at some of the recipes you have on, on there. Um, I wanted to circle back because you you talked a lot about Texas. I know you got the class coming up here uh, into October, and 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 I know this is one of you know a few different classes you've done down here. I, I heard your podcast. You guys are talking about turkey hunt down there, and the brothers that you've you're you're connecting with. How did you find your way from being out in California to you know hunting down here in Texas and having classes down here? What's uh, what's the connection there? Yeah, so my first hunt in Texas was five years ago. Uh, I got asked to be part of Silencer Co. Used to do a film series called Harvested. Um, they did, they did a dozen or a dozen episodes, and I'm really good friends with who was their marketing manager at the time, Darren Jones. Um, and he asked me to come down and hunt. Actually, we're supposed to go to Ohio to hunt uh, whitetail. Big old Ohio whitetail was actually supposed to be my episode, and then stuff happened where I couldn't go on the dates. So he's like, crap, I got to figure something else out. He goes, what is something else that you want to hunt? And I was like, Darren, I'll, I'll, I'll hunt anything I, that you want me to. And him and I were talking and he found out I just got back from India. I went to India to help with an orphanage up there. And we were talking about stuff. I was like, man, I saw these Sital in India. And he's like, Axis deer? And I was like, well, call, call it what you want, but they call it Sital. But yes, Axis deer. And I go, it's, oh man, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's this. He goes, dude, you know, you can hunt. I was like, but you know, it's illegal to hunt. We also saw blue antelope, AKA Neil guy. And that's where the, you know, if people don't know, they originate from India. They were brought over to Texas in 1912, 1919 by the King's ranch. They traded uh, cattle for Neil guy at first. And Neil guy were so big and dumb that they would knock over all these fences. They couldn't keep men. So they're like, oh, let's, let's get some access. And then the access were jumping over six foot fences. They're like, no, nah, all right. There's now more native Neil guy and access in Texas. And there is an Indian in Pakistan now, um, which is crazy to think about. So thanks Kings ranch. Um, little shout out to them. Did not know uh, that. But now you do. I you mean will. about the numbers. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, well, just like uh, scimitar oryx, there's more scimitar oryx in this in Texas than there is. They're actually, Texas is actually sending them back to the, their homelands to, re- to rehabilitate them. And uh, more tigers via Joe Rogan. I know he mentioned that in one yeah. of his. Yeah. And there's also, um, <laughs> There are also, there's a couple of ranches that I know of that are, that are building sanctuaries for rhinos in Texas. They're trying to build the population back up of rhinos in Texas. Cause it's so similar to that area. Uh, so thanks Texas. But so what happened is he was like, 
well, how about you come out and you shoot an access in Texas? It's like, yeah, sure. Sounds great. So I went down to, uh, um, Harlingen down by Brownsville down very, very bottom point and met up with a guy and we hunted and it was the middle of, I think it was July 17th. So it was, um, what I like to call, uh, the surface of the sun in Texas down there. And so we're sitting in, in pop-up blinds trying to hunt access deer and just, I mean, in the, just drenched sweating. You mean a sweat lodge? Sir. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> we, we call that our sous vide. We're like, we're sitting in a sous vide. Um, <laughs> And ended up shooting a, a, a giant um, buck. It was like our third day. We were discouraged. You haven't really couldn't see anything. It was so hot. And this big old boy just came trotting along. And I told the camera guy, I said, you better be on it. Cause I'm pulling it. As soon as he makes any s- movement of slowing down, I'm pulling the trigger and dropping this guy. He's like, got it. No problem. So uh, we did it. We, and I just fell in love from that moment. I'm like, this is, this is awesome. Be able to just hunt on your property and hunt and land. So that ranch owner invited me back a couple of times during that year to hunt some whitetail and some waterfowl with him just because he wanted to learn different things as well. And we were talking about, I was like, yeah, I'd really like to, I, I want to start a class. He's like, we'll do it at my ranch. I was like, what? He's like, just do it at my ranch. I was like, okay. So my first class, we literally, I did three classes back to back to back. I was there for three and I was there for almost a month and just loved it. And then I came back and did another class the next year. And then we did a bunch more stuff with him throughout that. And then other ranches started hearing about what I was doing. So they had me come to their ranches and, and hunt and fish. So oh, I've been all over Texas. You know, I think I've, I've hunted 30 to 40 times, maybe at different ranches in the past five years. And then I got into hog hunting up there and was just blown away. I'm like, you, cause here in California, we have a lot of pigs, but we're paying like $40 a tag for pigs. And there, they're like, here's an AR 15, shoot as many as you can. I was like, I came back there. I was like, how many shoot? I was like, oh, I think 175. He's like, oh yeah. Um, and he's like, well, you're a good shot. And so it just kind of, it became a second home. Uh, I taught, I've taught in ag classes for different schools in Texas. They'll fly me out and they'll bring in like 30 deer and have it in their ag classes. I'm teaching butchering classes um, to these students in their ag classes uh, in college and in high school. And then, you know, the, the newest ranch that I'm working with is the Gill brothers, two young brothers, uh, West Texas, West Texas outfitters, phenomenal young dudes. Um, and we're doing classes with them and kind of some meat week type deals in their ranches down in Comstock Del Rio area. So, Oh, so that's a different ranch from the one that you originally started with. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was thinking I've done it at like five or six different ranches since that first. Okay. Okay. And it's just, it's just to change the scenery. It's to change the animals. I mean, I've done it in, I mean, yeah six or seven ranches I've done. And I've done it at different at like an access place. We've done it. You know, I've had ranches that have called me up. Hey, we've got a bunch of new guys in here. We want to teach them how to butcher it here. So we don't have to send it off to a processor. Can you come in? And so it's kind of fun because I get to go hunt for free. Just teach. So it's like, Hey, you want to go shoot a couple of red stag while you're here on the property? Sure. If I guess, if I gotta. Um, and so it's, it's been just kind of that lifelong. It feels like my second home. Um, like I'm going there in October, I'm going there in December, I'm going there in January, I'm going there in February. Uh, if I could move there today, I would, but my wife's got a great job and I support, she supported me. So I'm supporting her. Yeah. So that's kind of where Texas started was that first hunt of hunting access deer. And it's just exploded. I met that odd dad right there. That was, that, this is like a 14 year old sow. And one rancher was like, well, we don't need odd dad. And I was like, oh, I'll prove you wrong. So he's like, well, come shoot a sow and, a, and, and you know, in a male and we'll, we'll see which one tastes better or an ewe and a ram. Uh, and we shot two of the oldest ones we could find and they tasted incredible. So, so now are you at a point where, um, with the classes, I, I believe, I, I, from a podcast or, um, or one of your blog posts, I feel like I've read or heard that you're over 300 plus people that you've taught to not only hunt, but butcher and think about various recipes and the, the preparation of meat, right? Yeah. After this class, it'll be 350. Okay. After yeah. the next class in October. So to think about in five years, 350 adults from the ages of, I think the youngest one that came was 18. The oldest one that came was 92. Um, and in every, you, you name an age, you name a profession. I've had professional heart surgeons come. I've had CEOs of giant companies. I've had, you know, 
a mom whose husband died and her kids wanted to learn how to hunt. And she was in her fifties. And so she came out and never touched a gun before in her life. She showed up in blue Nike gear. She said, can I wear this? I was like, yeah, we're sitting in a box blind. I don't care what you wear. Works. And, yeah. and you know, she shot a deer and she processed the whole thing. And then she went and she taught her kids how to hunt. And so for me, that's been the biggest, I think, blessing out of all this is, is I've, I've got to do, like, I want to become a cop because I want to save lives. When I couldn't become a cop to save lives, I was going to become a youth pastor to save lives. When I, when I decided not to become a youth pastor, I got in the restaurant industry and I started developing training programs because I wanted people to better their lives. Now I look at what I'm doing. I'm actually saving lives and I'm actually bettering lives. Kind of it all has, has focused into this big thing. And my, my next big, I wish I could talk about this next big project, but as soon as it's done, it's going to, I'll be back on or you guys can come to mind. But it, it, it's really going to be a training tool that is going to change our industry. Um, it's going to, I, there's nothing like it out there, which I researched and have a million other people researching it. And if it can be done the way I want it to get done, it's going to be that next step. You ask like, what's, what, what, what do I see for the future? I think this is the future of it. Um, there's so many people out there making beautiful food that I think there needs to be, now there has to be that mediator again. And I looked in sort of that, that, what was that movie? It's like, see a need, fill a need, like robots, right? right. Um, yeah. And so it's like, I've been seeing this need and how can I fill this need? And I remember I was laying in bed and I told my wife, she's like, well, I know I can't stop you. And I know you, you know, she's like, you have a million other things in the fire. She's like, so just add another thing. Cause it, if, even if I tell you to wait, you're like, nah, I'm not going to wait. Um, and so it's, it's going to be killer. And it's really going to kind of, I think, it's going to take the, the, the industry by, the, by storm just for the fact of it's different. And it's really going to put the industry in, in your hands, in that vegetarian who wants to learn the next step. It's going to put the industry in their hands. It's going to take out a lot of the middleman um, aspect of it. And it's really going to become something that I think people can just hold on to. The people that I have shared it with are like throwing money to back the idea and the program because they're like, take it. Uh, so we're going to, we're going to do a Kickstarter, hopefully starting beginning of the year. And then everyone that's part of that Kickstarter is going to get some really cool things, uh, involved with it. But I'm at, I've got a whole new website designed and coming out. That's going to be part of it. New merch, uh, new gear, uh, new books. So it's going to be one of those ideas that comes out that really, and, and, and I think it all started because I can't eat beef, which is even crazier to think about that your life can change because you're afraid of, you know, puking. Man, I'm, I'm very excited to see uh, all this, you know, come to fruition. And it's it's neat too, like, you know, kind of tying back to what you're saying earlier about how you've written things in journals that are, you know, 150 or so recipes or whatever you haven't even tried out yet. And how, you know, there's different types of people in the world. And, and those who set their mind to do something, whether it's for their own exploratory reasons or their own interests, you know, um, from what I'm gathering about you, it's not about the end of the day dollar. I mean, who doesn't want to like get paid for what they love to do and really be able to have that kind of career. And I mean, it's like you, you've, you've taken those steps, but it wasn't about like this purpose thing of like, Oh, this is going to fund all these other things. And and it sounds like you're doing it the right organic way. And that these things kind of blossom as they will. And it might be a dream that you had in the pike, you know, four years ago. And you're like, all right, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and put this down. And, you know, eventually as you work towards other things, those kind of build as well. And uh, I, I, I love seeing when those kinds of things happen. So it's neat to hear about this because there's going to be a time when we're going to be sitting down and talking about, hey, remember when you were talking about it? Now it's here. And it's, I think you could probably look back on all these different stages of your development, you know, when you couldn't eat beef and then you started the company and then you have classes and then you have um, a podcast. And I, I guess it'd be a good time to mention that because. I think you, you know, you know, you're, you're over a dozen episodes so far. I mean, we're, we're at the moment, we're kind of in about the same. It sounds like you and I kind of started doing ours around the same time there too. Um, what was the, um, cause I know you did videos before, but what was your decision on, on taking that role into the podcast and what's, what's some of your goals of that particular podcast? What are you hoping to, to have that kind of grow to, or, or just enjoying while you're at it? Yeah. When I first started out, I had a podcast with like six other dudes 
because that's when podcasting just started and we're like, let's all do it together. And we got a, a bunch of episodes in, but it, we found out that it's just so hard when you have six dudes trying to ask a question to one guy, uh, even two for two of you, it's, it's, it's difficult. Cause you, you want to have this conversation. It's like, oh, okay, I got to let the other guy talk. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it kind of fell apart just because we couldn't, and it's also, we were all from all over the different country. So it's trying to get somebody at six o'clock my time, which was, you know, 10 o'clock their time or whatever, or a guy was in Hawaii and it was like, oh my gosh. Uh, so I kind of stopped doing it. And then I started doing another one during COVID, uh, with my buddy. Um, and we got, I think we got like 50 episodes in during COVID just cause there was nothing else to do. And everyone else was sitting around. So we're like, let's just talk. Um, and kind of went separate ways, um, on that end too, just because he got so slammed with his company. Once the world opened back up, it was like, dude, we don't have time just to sit here in the middle of the day and chat anymore. Uh, on, on his end, my, my end, I work from home and write recipes and cook. So I could sit down whenever I want, as long as it's not when I have to go pick up my kids from school. Mm-hmm. And so I was just sitting there and we were actually, um, we were, I was getting ready to go turkey hunting this spring. And I was just chatting with my buddies and I was like, man, I should start a podcast. And they're like, what? Yeah, you should like, cause I still get people that are listening to my old podcast from like five, six years ago. And they're like, oh, it's awesome. I was like, I should just, I want it, but I want to do one where I can just talk and I can just talk about real people, real food, real things, real, you know, like have no structure, have no questions, just be like, Hey, let's talk. I don't care who you are, what you are. I mean, I've talked to, uh, yeah, I'm what 13 episodes in and I, you know, it's like I went dove hunting and ran into the head of fish and wildlife. I was like, Hey, you want to sit down and talk? He's like, yeah, let's do it. And so we just talked about fish and wildlife and, and what, it, what his life was and, you know, then going on in NWTF, they're doing a conservation week. I was like, Fred, do you want to come on? He's like, sure, let's come on. And so I think that's kind of how it is. It's just, I just want it to be so many people want to be a fly on the wall so often. And so I think just letting them be a part of a conversation. And I don't know about you guys, but my podcast is, is exploding um, faster than I can ever imagine. Um, I get the numbers every week and I'm like, seriously, like, I think I had, I had 113 downloads from Ireland. Like people in Ireland are tuning in from field to play podcast to listen to me talk to, you know, an ex whatever about something. And it's just, it's encouraging to think that people are listening to it. Um, and even putting up, like looking at numbers, I just send numbers to NWTF. And it's like, I posted that episode last Thursday, I think is when it was. Mm-hmm. And it's already like 2000 downloads in a couple of days. You're sitting there going, why do people want to hear me talk? But I think that that just keeps validating why I'm doing what I'm doing. And this podcast was literally just the from field to play podcast. It wasn't gonna be anything catchy. It was just like, dude, this is what I am. This is, this is my brand. Why am I? The problem with all these other podcasts is I tried to create another brand and which is great, but your brand is who you are. And I've, I've created this and, you know, so that's just kind of how it started and where it's going. And I got people lined up. People are calling me. It's like, can I be on your podcast? I'm like, yeah, we can sit down and talk. Like, I don't care. I mean, I don't care if you're a seasoning company that nobody knows. Let's get on and let's chat about why you started. Because if that one story encourages one person, then my podcast was worth it. And it's part of that training culture that I'm so obsessed with is how can we teach people bigger, better, and more beautiful things, you know? Absolutely. And I, I, I love, you know, hearing about how you were writing certain types of, you know, uh, you know, I guess, processes, manuals, whatever it is, and that kind of training procedure with other companies too. Like that's a neat thing to learn. And and then kind of it gives you a different perspective on what it is that you're doing now. And, and, you know, with your, your, your company, with your podcast, your videos and things too, that just kind of gives me another angle. It's, and that's, what's so neat is like, that might be, you know, one of these things that I've learned today, but I love that about podcasts when you're just having those open conversations, you hear about some, Oh man, that's why they did that. Or, Oh, that makes a lot more sense. And just kind of put into those puzzle pieces together. You know, when I started mine, it was basically, you know, I had a lot of friends that were like, what are you going to interview? Cause I worked a lot with native American elders and traveled around and worked with medicine men and women there. Or I've, you know, been a you know touring musician. There's things are like, Oh, are you going to talk about just that? You talk about that. No, I'm going to talk about interesting people talking about interesting things they're doing because I don't want to have to pigeonhole this thing. And there, there's probably already someone who's already talked about this kind of aspect. It's like, well, 
I just like talking with people and putting together their stories and sharing those out there in the world and how those might be inspiring and such as like what you're doing too. It's like, I, I find, I want to help inspire people. I want people to go and look at your website at, at, you know, your projects and be like, Oh, this is how I can take this from this next level. And, you know, just kind of educating yourself throughout the process and whether it's, you know, and WTF, or it's like you said, fish and game, you know, I, one thing that, that, you know, talking about that NWTF interview there and, and about conservation week, which, you know, just happened. Um, I listened to that. It just so happened. I saw the podcast pop up right when I was driving to work and I was like, Oh, I'm going to tune into this one, you know, and I'm going to check this out right now. And you were talking about um, an experience and, and the story of how you had gone to a, a gentleman's property and you had, uh, you were inquiring about access there potentially to hunt some dove. And I want you to kind of talk about what happened and, and what you ended up doing, which kind of caught his eye and attention. And I wanted to ask too, when, you know, when you went back there, I know you, you mentioned you had a bunch of different folks there in the high 20 numbers there too, is uh, one, is that the place that you brought folks back to, to go hunt? Yeah, and, it is. And, and then is that um so if you, i guess just walk us through there and then I'll, I'll i'll come back with another question on that so how how did you find this particular spot what made you want to go there and uh what ended up happening with that yeah so we were talking about conservation week uh with fred bear or fred bird over at nwtf which was last week um which is all about getting out and doing something you know and about cleaning up our areas our hunting spaces and i told him a story was a couple of years ago we were driving around trying to find somewhere to hunt dove uh, down by where we hunt dove down by the Colorado river in Blythe. And we drove by and we saw this cut wheat field that had thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dove just circling and flying. I mean, it looked like Argentina. It was gorgeous. And we were like, Oh my gosh. And then we look at the road to get in there and it says no hunting, no trespassing. We're like, balls. So we kind of drove around, tried to find other fields, or every field, no hunting, no pests. It was all this guy's property. So I was like, wow, that sucks. So I get on Onyx and I look and if you pay for your Onyx, you can see landowners. So I'm like, all right, we know the landowner. And I knew a buddy in Blythe and I'm like, do you know this person? He's like, yeah, yeah, I know this person. So talk to this guy and um, go up to his house and he's like, knock on. He's like, nope, no hunting at all. Hunters are gross. They're trash in my property. They blah, blah, fill, fill in the blank of every stereotypical hunter aspect thing that you've heard, seen, or done. This is what that guy is saying no to. And I was like, hey, you know what? I totally understand. I get it. We're different hunters. This is what I do for a living. Here's my business card. Here's my website. Uh, nope, 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 nope. Perfect. No problem. Thank you so much for taking the time. Shake the guy's hand. Be respectful. Because I think a lot of times people get so pissed off. And just be respectful of that person. It's his property. You can say no if he wants to. Yeah. And so we go back by and we start, we have to pass the fields to go back out. And as we go, we realize there's just tons of trash on the roadside. Like the, from, from the country road to, there's no fences, right? Cause it's all farmland. So it's just, you can just, and just into his field was tires and trash bags and mylar balloons and fill in the blank water bottles everywhere. Right. So I call up a couple of the guys who are hunting. I said, hey, come out here, bring some trash bags. We're going to clean up this guy's property line by his house that we can see. And they're like, well, dude, it's 116 degrees outside. I was like, then don't come if you don't want to, but bring me some trash bags. And so they come and we start cleaning up the stuff. We're just talking, having a good time. And the old timer comes cruising out on his little John Deere tractor, right? Like, what are you boys doing? I told you no hunting. We're like, oh, we're not. We're just, we drove by and realized just how disgusting this field was. And we want to say we're sorry for it, and we're just going to pick it up for you. He's like, why? No reason. Other than we have to drive by this, and we have to see this, and we want it clean. He's like, but why are you picking up trash? We're like, there's no, just because it's gross. That's what we do. And he was like, well, you guys are dumb. It's 100 and fill in the blank, right? <laughs> and so we turn around, or he turns around, drives back to his house, and we finished picking up this corner. We got like six or seven trash bags full. Filled the back of the truck. We drove and got rid of them. And then that night, uh, I get a phone call from him and he's like, how many people are hunting with you? I was like, I don't know. We have like 20 people. He goes, okay, cool. Come by my house. I, I got permission slips for you guys. And I was like, no, that's not why we did it. We didn't do it to hunt. We didn't do it. He's like, nope. He goes, I just saw, and we had this conversation with this guy where he's like, it just, you guys showed me something different in hunters than I've ever seen before. And he's like an 80 year old dude. 
And we go out there and he comes out the next day for opening morning. And he's out there in a lawn chair, drinking a beer, laughing, having the time of his life, watching us shoot stuff, you know, and his only stipulation to hunt the property was we make it better than when we left. And so we got there, you know, I, I made breakfast for everyone in, in the morning. We had like 20 hunters. I made this big, I always make a big breakfast opening day. We do, everyone puts in a dollar. Like if you've ever been fishing on a cattle boat, like biggest fish, we put in a dollar for biggest bird just to make it a fun experience yeah. for everybody that's out there. And I tell them, I said, Hey, the only reason we're hunting this property, there's a million birds. Everyone's going to limit out by seven o'clock. Every shell, every wadding, every casing, every piece of trash that's not yours is picked up. Here's a trash bag for every single person. Here's a magnet for every single person, like, or every group, figure it out. They're like, you got it. And we came back with trash bags full of stuff. This guy was just over the moon, right? Well, we're now hunting this guy's property over and over and over again, you know, his, where his grandkids are now coming out and hunting with us awesome. and learning how to hunt because, you know, we show up, he's like, yeah, how many, how many permits do you need? And we go out there and he's out, you know, we still do a big breakfast, still do this, still do that. And it's amazing to see how clean his field is. Because we go up there all year round to hunt deer, we, not, not in his property, but in that area. Mm -hmm. And I was driving to go hunt quail. And I saw one of my buddies who from dove season, he was like stopped and threw a tire in the back of his truck. He's like, oh, I just saw it here. It now became like our field. It became our responsibility. It became our passion, our joy, our love, all because we took the time to like shake a guy's hand, you know? That's, it's, you know... A lot of folks that are out there, they go out there and, you know, maybe the weekend warriors, they're, they're shooting stuff. They're not thinking about picking up their, their brass or their shells or whatever it may be, their wads. Like, I mean, I, I'm constantly doing that. It, I have a, 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 a ranch in my family that's been there five generations. And so there are five generations of trash and debris from different times you know oh, cool. never seen this magazine before you know this shell <laughs> it's like there's all these different things that we're finding and um we're trying to make a, a concerted effort to to clean up and we have we have a lot of illegal activity that's come through the property um you know we're not far from from the mexican border so we got a lot of people who are coming through illegally and there's a bunch of trash and, and backpacks and things that are that are there so it's like there's already a maintenance that we have to do but just to make sure that we're doing the right thing on our property, you know, we're going to be, you know, seeing it the most. It's not going to be out there in public, you know, sites. But whenever you have, you know, these areas that you're cleaning up that are either whether it's public lands or it's, you know, even, you know, the entrance to this guy's property that you're driving by, you know, I feel like we owe it. Um, it, I guess it's a, the difference too of being like a hunter and also maybe being an environmentalist, a conservationist. So I think I heard you know someone quote those like you know conservationist just an environmentalist with a gun. Like you're and not getting idea, paid. Though, what's that? And not getting paid. <laughs> right there you go. <laughs> but like you, like I've I've kind of thought about that word a lot and uh, over the last like six months, um, really kind of digging deep into that and like what it is that we want to leave behind. Um, not only just for the future generations, but for the examples of who we are. You know, I, I know you told another story where, you know, you had gone and there's a place you were deer hunting and, and you know, you kind of got accosted by a lady who's, what are you doing? You're killing the deer and everything. And then you also ended up showing her a backpack full of trash that you picked up and she changed her tune. And, you know, oh, I've seen that trash as I've walked up, you know, every single time. Yeah, but you didn't pick it up, did you? You yeah. didn't do it. Like, and there's plenty of people who see the problems out there in the world, whatever it may be, whether it's the trash, the debris, or just people, you know, with bad manners, whatever, they don't, they don't think to try to correct it or fix it. And uh, it's cool that you, you brought that out and that you have kind of made that, you know, inspiring to other people, you know, like you said, your buddy's picking up that, that other tire there too. I think that's huge, man. And, you know, I kind of, it made me kind of wonder about, some of these properties that you're on because you're on a lot of different places are, are there now conservational projects that you're like, besides just picking up trash, is there things that you and, and your buddies are starting to kind of, you know, pinpoint on what it is you want to do to improve that for future generations or maybe improve it for that habitat and wildlife that's on it. Yeah. And there's tons, like I go to a ranch. I remember I was, we were on an access ranch. We we're going to do a class. We pull into the property and there was, tons of trash along the fence line just when it came in i looked at the ranch owner and said how much money do you do you, do you charge for these access hunts tells me his number i was like okay great 
and I kind of just snap a picture with my cell phone and we're driving around and we kind of, he's showing me these different things I look over and his guides, one of the guides we're with literally just takes a soda bottle and chucks it out his chew. He just spit and chewing it kind of like chucks it out into the bushes. And I kind of take a picture of my phone and we get back to the ranch and I'll go, Hey, okay. So you're charging blank amount of money for this. You're giving them some amazing experience. I would be disgusted if I pay this much money. I go, so your guide was chewing in the back the whole time as a wad the size of you know Mississippi in his lip, spitting in a jar the entire time. If you want to chew, chew. But I have a thing. If you're taking out a client, be respectful. You're not sitting there with the, with the chew and spitting in a cup every five seconds. And I go, you chucked it in the bushes. Here's a picture of it. You know, when we pulled in the gate, you have this gorgeous, ornate, beautiful gate, and it's full of freaking trash. I said, do you know that it would take you five minutes to pick up that fence about how beautiful it would be? how gorgeous it would be coming in that front. I go first, first impressions, my, right? First thing my eye caught was looking down there. And the problem though, as you find, and I, I'm not saying this in a bad way, please don't take it that way, is a lot of the hired help in a lot of these areas don't care. It's not their land. It's not their property. They don't care. And a lot of it is the mentality of their ethnicity and how they grew up. Um, where it is. I mean, I, I live in border towns as well here in Southern California and you cross the border and it's just, it's a way of life. And so when they come on the property, it's now educating and teaching these people a different way of life and a different idea behind respecting it. And, and there was one guy, uh, I was speaking to him. He was one of the guys that was like in the skinning shed and the way he was doing stuff. And I told him to stop. And I said, if this was your deer, how would you be doing it? Oh, I do it like this, Hermes. Every deer that comes in this freaking skinning shed is your deer. You want a better tip? You want better this? You want better that? You know, money speaks to a lot of, and he's like, yeah. Dude, that dude is now scrubbing the concrete after every deer that comes in there. So it looks like a brand new place. You know, he's, he's sending me pictures of hogs that are coming in that he's actually taking the time to clean and not just cut the heads off and boil the skull for the, for the clients. Right. And so I think when you start to that whole, you know, with them, you know, you've probably heard that before, especially in the restaurant industry. It's the, it's the what's in it for me. Um, well, we actually changed that at my restaurant. Remember, I told you all that stuff. It's like, what's in it for them? Um, so, who cares about what's in it for you? Who, who cares at all? What's in it for the people that are going to continue to come back and pay your paycheck? So, I can tell you, well, what's in it for you is you're going to make better tips, but you know what's in it for them? Better service. The better your service, the better the tip, the better you are clean, you know, cleanliness wise. There's a reason that I would have, you know, cleaning supplies at the, at the host stand. If someone put their hand on a door to push it open, their job was to go clean that hand mark because the next person that comes in should feel like they were the only person to go through that door that day. And so when I look at butchering down an animal, it's all about, I want my family to have the most cleanest and beautiful experience they can. I did a research for Time Magazine where it was like the average steak that goes into a grocery store has touched 100 to 150 things or hands or machines, Right. 100, 100 things have touched that piece of meat before it, hit, it, it hits your table. That's disgusting. Right. And so when you talk about hunting in the hunting industry and why I do what I do is I'm trying to teach people that these two hands are all you need to be successful, that these two hands are all you need to make an, an, a lasting impression in someone's life, that these two hands are the only thing that your kids should feel when they wake up in the morning and when they go to bed um, at night is the hug or the embrace or the, or the, the touch of their cheek is because your hands are, are super powerful. And if you can control what your hands do, be it cleaning a, a window so the next guest that comes in feels like they're the first people in your restaurant that day, or me sitting and s staying up till two o'clock, teaching somebody again how to take off a backstrap or a tenderloin. I was teaching a class and this one girl who was in the class and she looked at me, she goes, I don't get it. And I go, what? She's like, we have asked you the same stupid question 30 times and you give us the most respectful answer every single time. And I went, cause you asked the question. My job isn't to get angry and to get violent and to get, you know, I worked in restaurants. Like my wife's trying to make me watch that show bear. I think is what it's called. Or the, like the chef one on Netflix, about some chef guy. I don't know the name of it. Mm -hmm. I watched like one episode. I said, I can't watch it. I'm getting PTSD of working in a restaurant of everyone yelling and screaming at each other and cussing each other out. Like I literally had a tip jar in my restaurant. Just back there, it said, if you said any words, and I had a whole list of words, and people could add any word they want to it. If you say that word, money goes in there at the end of the year, whatever money's in there, I'm going to give it away to someone in the restaurant. Because you're, not only do your hands control all things, but your words and your, and your actions speak louder. And so by me going and cleaning up that field, 
I could have went and complained about that dude. I could have went over to that guy and said, you're stupid. You're an idiot. But my actions spoke louder than my words. By me continually doing what I'm doing, you know, I've taken out ex-vegans, vegetarians on multiple hunts because they're like, they, one of the guys came at me with death threats for like a year. Finally, he's like, I want to learn how to hunt. I'm like, okay, show up. I, hand, I, I put a gun in this freaking dude's hand that had been giving me death threats and said, let's go shoot an animal, right? And now this guy's a ridiculous hunter, amazing hunter. But through our conversations, through the, the mutual respect that I can share with people, I think that's where our world needs to go. We're so caught up in just this fast food mentality, this fast world mentality that no one takes the time to sit down and have dinner anymore. No one Nor takes does time. anyone take time to pick up trash. Yeah, I mean, that's conservation. Base, you know, you go to a, you go to a freaking kid, kid's baseball game. And how many of those parents just throw stuff under the bleachers? And you're like, mm-hmm. you're a freaking, you know, idiot moron who's doing, you know, we, we were at the river with our family for my mom's birthday over the 16th. And I remember my daughters were playing and there was like a water bottle floating way out in the river. My young, my oldest is like, I go, where, the, where are you going? She comes like, I caught a water bottle. Throws, like we're teaching that next generation that, Hey, we're playing in this water. We're respecting this water, but it's really discouraging to see this next generation coming up who has no respect for anybody but themselves. And it's, it's, it's sad and it's dis- disheartening because you look at I me, mean, you talked about, you did a lot of stuff with, uh, with native Americans, mm-hmm. you know, indigenous. I remember sitting in, in, we were in New Mexico and this dude was roasting hatch chilies by a gas station. And I went over and bought every hatch chili he had. Cause they're my absolute favorite. That's like, chili. So yes. good. I was like, I was like, I'll can them, freeze them, you know, mm-hmm. boil them, you name it. And he invited us to dinner. It was this, this old native American dude. And we went and my buddy I was with us like, no, we can't do that. He's going to kill us. He's going to, I'm like, we sat there for, we ended up spending the night at this dude's house. Cause his wife made us, she wouldn't let us leave. She's like, you have to stay. It's so late. And just to hear their culture and their stories. And he start he started, he started crying saying that all these next generation of the native Americans who don't want to learn how to hunt. Don't want to learn how to fend for themselves because the casinos are giving them money. And he's like, and so no one's going out and doing this stuff and no one is keeping our culture. No one wants to continue with powwows. No one wants, and he starts, and it like hearing the, the, the sadness in this old chief's voice. And I go home and now I'm looking back and that was six, seven years ago. I'm looking back at it now. I'm going, Oh my gosh, we're in the same predicament is we have our generation who is so caught up with this stupid thing and TikTok videos and going viral and making themselves 15 seconds famous that the respect and the honor for our culture is gone, you know? And I ended up getting all my degrees and stuff in college for cultural and physical you know, anthropology because I love the studying of people and, and places, which you can see with my training and hunting and stuff. And to watch our culture be continually killed because some celebrity says you should do this is disgusting, you know? I think a lot of platforms out there, such as yours, I mean, that's the beauty of it. One person at a time, just kind of reconnecting them back to nature, back to what's important. And I just want to uh, highlight that that um, I think you are um, an inspiration in that regard and um, and really have enjoyed um, that, you know, like over the years or over the last few months, like really digging into who you are. I, I think that's one of the biggest um, aspects of what you do is, is those classes and, 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 and kind of teaching people a better way in that. And it, yeah, it's just about like one animal at, and, and, and sort of, the butchery of it and like, and, and like the, the tangibles in that moment. But I think it can leave an impression for a lifetime and, and other generations for those people too, you know? And, and so, um, you, uh, just more to nature and away from technology is, is you're right. It's what society needs. Agreed. Yeah, man, I, I, I love that idea, you know, of, I mean, look, everything's like that kind of, you know, fast food, pop a pill culture, here's how to, you know, it's like, you're never getting at the source of things. And, you know, kind of going back to that, you know, the Native American example, you just spoke, you know, indigenous, you know, examples too, and like our true hunting and gathering, like historical past as humans, you know, we, 
we're going back like a lot of times, like you said, the, the steak is a perfect example. And it's been touched 125, 150 different hands or different surfaces or things. And too, and it's like when, when we're out there hunting, you know, I, I was brought up, you know, it's, I learned gun safety at a young age. My uncle was a police officer and he wanted me to learn about gun safety in case I was at my friend's house. And one of their, you know, one of the kids pulled out a gun that was mom or dad's that, you know, was it, it loaded and under a bed or something like you're going to know what to do and how to be safe and make sure that you or your friends aren't injured. And, you know, that was kind of his concern at that kind of introduction. And I learned a lot. And then I kind of, you know, moved on to, to hunting and then like making sure, you know, what you shoot, you will clean and you will, you will eat it. And here is like, you're not just going to go out here and just shoot, you know, 20 rabbits just to just shoot something. Like if you're going to shoot 20 rabbits, you're going to clean 20 rabbits. And it, you know, I haven't had that kind of night, but when we've gone out, like I've been able to put my hands on my food and I'm, I'm taking it home and I'm, you know, preserving it and preparing it. And then sharing that time and that experience with my friends or with my family, or, you know, like I, I know you kind of talked about having that open door policy at one point in time, where it's like somebody needed something out of the freezer, you know, it's the same kind of thing. So, Oh man, I really like that. Oh yeah. Here, take this with you. You know, here's, here's an example or, Hey, go check out Jeremiah's, you know, video on this. This is how you can make this to where it'll be exactly what you, you, you want or whatever it is like that hands-on experience, being out in the woods, there's, 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 it, it totally connects and fulfills every kind of these primal desires that I have when I'm out there and I'm waking up with the day and I'm going to bed with the day and I'm cooking something that was just alive. And I'm recognizing, yes, I did just in the, the life of this particular animal, but I've also recognized that. And it's that complex you know, creation and association with that all too. And at the same time, I'm making sure that I'm doing all the different things so that that animal's never gone from our landscape. I mean, we've, we've, you know, all of us, you know, I, I know you're, you're, you're closing in on 40, I think, right. You're, you're yeah. getting there. So it's like, we've, February. we've, you know, well, cool, man. I mean, you're, you're, we're <laughs> on the same ages, you know, and, and we're, we've seen, you know, a lot of different species gone from the extinction list that are, some bigger name species but there's so many you know thousands that we don't even know of and it's like we i feel like we need to preserve all those kinds of things for future generations and you know as strange it is for some people to understand it's like hunters are one of the biggest reasons why there is a you know conservation movement in the united states and in worldwide too but what we've done here and the Pittman robertson act and the different things we've done to leave something better behind and leave something for those future generations. And, you know, like the seventh generation, it's like the native American idea, right? Yeah. So I always think about that same thing. So I, I love that, that idea that, you know, you're, you're being an example, not only on, on trying to do something that's, uh, you know, from your field to your plate, but also what you're doing in your backyard and in your neighbor's land, because it's all, it all is connected when it really comes down to it. So what you're doing, those ripple effects from your cannonball has, uh, has, has definitely affected a lot of people. And, and I'm, I'm happy that to see what all you're doing and to continue to see where it all grows and, uh, and, and how it's done in such an organic fashion, man, uh, hats off to you on that. And Yeah. I appreciate that. No, it's, it's been, it's been a hard road because there's so many people in, in the industry itself that have blackballed me for not doing what they think needs to be done. Uh, lost a lot of friends who, you know, quote, unquote, quotations who do it one way. And they're like, well, you're doing it the wrong way. You're doing it this. And I'm like, I don't really care. Like, and I think that's been that mentality of, of, I don't care. You know, it's like in the end of the day, what I do, if my, if I can go to bed with the respect of my family, then I did my job. And because if I go and I respect you, it shows my daughter's respect and my daughter, you know, it's like, it's this, this trickle down effect. Mm -hmm. And that's just kind of how I live my life. It's how I live my mentality of everything. It's, I don't know. It's, and it's different because I'm not scared to fail. I think a lot of people nowadays are scared to fail. And I think once you get, once you get scared to fail, you'll never really put yourself out there. Um, you'll never put yourself in a position where you will be able to fail. And I think failing is huge because failing allows you to develop. I can't tell you how many recipes I've made that I don't post that I'm like, mm, yeah, that sucked. Um, and my daughters, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll take a bite. And they're like, can we order pizza? 
And I think that's where it's encouraging is, you know, get out there, fail, you know, failure's growth. Oh yeah. yeah. And, and, and knowledge, like my grandpa used to always tell us, if you ain't learning, you're dying. Mm -hmm. And so the moment I sit there and say, I have it all, my wife gets mad at me all the time. Cause we'll go, you know, we went to a thrift store the other day cause the girls wanted to look for something for whatever, for a Halloween costume. And I go straight over to the, the old book section and I'm like, She's like, you don't need any more old books. I'm like, oh, look at this. Yes, I do. Yes, look, I do. A, Betty, a Betty Crocker cookbook from 1933. She's like, why? I was like, I don't know. Like, but you go back and look at some of these different ideas and these different, and it's, it's that culture that, that we're developing, that we're building. And for me, it's encouraging that you guys saying that because, again, I started this to better, that the whole reason from Field to Plate started was that someone didn't have to struggle like I struggled in, in the beginning. And from Field to Plate encompasses everything. From the moment you hit the field to the moment you're eating in the plate, everything in the middle is part of that from field to plate culture. And a lot of people think it's just the food, but going out and picking up trash is part of the field. Taking your kids out there, talk, listen to stories from an old timer who's going to die. And, you know, I think I, I ended up buying a portable podcast machine recently just for the fact that anywhere and everywhere I go, I'm taking it with me because there's always a story. Be, I, could you imagine? the story around the table with that chief and his wife that we could have on a podcast that he's, he's dead. He, it, he has to be long gone. He was like way old and his stories have stopped. Like I'm the only one that has the stories that we talked about and those stories are no longer there and no one's no, people aren't, aren't writing stories anymore. People are wanted to do challenges and wanted to do things to get noticed. They're not just sitting there listening to a story and sitting around a campfire and hearing the crackle of a fire and hear someone retell the shot or the miss, I think is what a lot of people are missing. Even, even not around hunting, just sitting around the dinner table. Like I have a friend who their kids are in a million and one sports. And he was saying he was, him and his wife are struggling in marriage and they're struggling with their kids. And I'm like, well, when was the last time you guys sat down and had a meal together? He's like, I can't even tell you. I go, that's why your family's falling apart. It's because you're not Bring taking the back. time. You're not taking the time to be a family. And I think, why I do what I do and why I tell the stories and why you'll, you'll continually hear me tell stories. I mean, even through my food, you'll hear me tell, you know, a story through the food of what inspired or what is because that's that legacy. I want to leave. I want to leave this story. I want to leave this world better than I, than I entered it. And I want people to be encouraged to tell their stories and to, to be excited about it. And you don't have to have the most expensive knife in the world to be an amazing chef, you know, I don't know if you've heard the story, but I was doing a charity event and this is, I really wasn't anybody. I was still, you know, this is a couple of years ago and I was cooking quail and there was a bunch of big name chefs there. Um, this is this Anthony Bourdain was there and Bobby Flay and bunch of, you name it. it was a huge charity event and I got asked to cook wild quail and I'm cooking it. And I remember Bobby Flay came over and he was just super rude you're not a chef. You haven't gone to school. You haven't fill in, the, fill, fill in the blank. And I was like, dude, you didn't even try my freaking food. Like, yeah, I may not have the title of, of Cordon Bleu, but my food's good and it's tasty. And I never called myself a chef but, but before this moment. And I remember Anthony Bourdain come, came over in the middle of the conversation and he shoved Bobby Flay away. And he goes, let me, let me have one of those quail. And so I put the sauce on it, handed it to him. And he's like, this is the best bite of quail I've ever had in my life. And I've eaten a lot of things. He was, he's like, hey, you have 10 minutes to go talk? He's like, your sous chefs can handle this, right? I'm like, sure. So Anthony Bourdain and I sit down. Mind you, nobody knows who I am. I just started from field to plate. I you know, don't even have a, my own brand logo yet. And we talked and he goes, hey, don't let anyone discourage you. He goes, you become a chef when you've mastered a step or a craft. He goes, you have mastered that aspect. He's like, I'm proud to call you chef. And we sat and we talked for a long time. And his, his agents come over like, ah, Bardane, we got to go. He's like, I'm in the middle of a conversation. And this dude who just for years got crapped on by everyone in the industry because he's not a classically trained chef. He didn't, he didn't go to school for it. He just hard knocks, became an amazing, amazing chef. He didn't even want to, I mean, did you watch the documentary on him? It was on Netflix. Mm -hmm. Ridiculous. Phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and it sticks with me to that moment. It's like, there's this guy who was at the top of his, the top of his game who sat down with a nobody and said, 
you're awesome. And, and it was encouraging. And I remember from that moment on, I was like, okay, I guess I'm a wild game chef because I've mastered the art of wild game. And it was, it was fun and it was encouraging, but sit down and tell the story with him. And that's why he continued on his thing was he wanted to tell the story of these cultures and this food and this flavor. Like I've traveled the world. I've been to 22 different countries. I've eaten things that people shouldn't eat. And I've sat around stories with people that shouldn't have told the stories sitting in India, eating goat in the middle of nowhere with a tribe. And they're telling the story of how they killed the goat or, you know, we're in Ecuador and we're with this, this orphanage and these little kids are swimming out into the, you know, towards the Galapagos islands, diving down, getting urchins and starfish coming back and cooking them in rice. These little 10, 11 year old kids, like sitting there laughing, eating a, you know, a sea star, which I don't recommend. They're disgusting, but telling the story with these kids and, and remembering that for the rest of my life, it, it builds who I am as a person. It builds who I am as a chef. And if my food that the recipe that I created can change one person's view on it, I can't tell you how many. So on Pinterest, I have tons and tons and tons of followers on Pinterest and million, you know, recipe saved a million times. It's 99% women who are saving that stuff. And a lot of these women have reached out to me. They're wives of hunters who don't know how to cook food and their husband, they just cook chili. And now they're encouraged and they're making all these deals. And now these women are going, I had some of these girls that actually paid for an entire class of their friends who husbands hunt, husbands won't take them hunting. They paid to come out and take a class. And I took these five women out and they shot deer and they cooked and they're like, all right, we're better than our husbands now. Cause our husbands came back with nothing. Like we ended up shooting big deer. Like they were supposed to shoot doe. And then the rancher found out why they're there. He's like, we're shooting big deer. I mean, they were shooting like one eighties, one nineties. He's like, see that deer, shoot it, shoot it. He didn't care. He's like, I want you to bring it back. He's like, show me a picture of your husband's biggest deer. Okay. I'll find you a bigger deer. And <laughs> these, and awesome. these girls are shooting. I'm at Ma, like this one came out. I said, how much would that deer cost? He's like $25,000. I was like, he's like, but it's worth it for them to take it home to their husband. I was like, it's your ranch, not mine. Um, but to me, that's where I get encouraged. It's like that, those women who are now empowered to be better, who are going to show their daughters that it's not a guy's hunting camp you know, and it's, it's family camp and it's hunting camp. There's no, I don't care about genders. I don't care about roles. I don't care about whatever else. Let's fill the freezer because for my daughters, I told them all, I said, Hey, the more, if you guys want to hunt, that just means the more dove and deer we can have in the freezer. Cause daddy can only have three times a day. The, the limit. I can only have 45 dove in the freezer. If you guys want to have over a hundred dove in the freezer. Y'all need to get out there and start shooting dove because you guys like eating it. So if we can have a hundred plus, let's get out there. And so my daughter's like, all right, let's get out there. You know, I'm, they're trying to get my wife to hunt. I told her for my 40th, all I want is her to get her hunting license. So we can go sit in the duck blind as a family with the dog. So she's still telling her friends, I got to go get my hunting license this year. So I can go sit in a duck blind. I was like, listen, you want to go to freaking Hawaii and spend, I just want you to go sit in a duck blind and throw me a Ninja Turtle birthday party at like an arcade. Like, that's all I want for my 40th. Like, I don't want anything fancy. I just want you to shoot a duck in the face, you know? Just, just tell her there's hunting in Hawaii as well. Well, she, she loves going when I hunt in Hawaii because she sits on the beach with a, with a Mai Tai and I go up to the volcano and shoot axis deer. And then we come down with all the locals and we go fishing and we bring back fish, you know, surf and turf. And she's like, I love it. Cause all these local Hawaiians are just cooking hand and foot over us. She's like, I'll go hunt with you in Hawaii anytime. I was like, no, you got to go hunting with me. She's like, no, I enjoy the beach. And you guys, come she back hunts home. the Mai Tais. It, yeah. It, she, she kind of counts Mai Tais <laughs> and the, uh, and the, the rum and Cokes or whatever else she's drinking. I don't know. I don't drink. So I just let her have fun and I go shoot critters. Is that uh, just out of curiosity? You mentioned not drinking. Did you used to drink and then you put it up, or is that nope, uh... never never had a drop in my life? Really? Yeah, grew up around alcohol alcoholism, had friends alcoholism, uh, some deaths due to alcohol. Mm -hmm. So at a very young age, I was like, ah, I don't need a drink. And then watching all my friends uh, in college just get plastered and waste all their money, so I started making a deal with my friends. As much money as they would spend at the bars on the weekend, I'd put into savings. Um, and then I told him to stop, stop drinking. Cause I didn't have that much money to continue to dump into savings. Um, uh, <laughs> but no, I've never, I cook with it. Like I'll cook all the alcohol. I've just never picked up a, a, and I meant worked in the restaurant industry my whole life. Worked as a bartender, bar manager, people like what, what, what tastes good. I was like, you know what I sell a lot of. So that's kind of how I got around it. I never said I don't drink, but I was like, Oh, you know what I sell a lot of as I sell, or they'd buy me shots and I'm like, Oh, it's a double to you. And I pour it in. Um, and they get all excited. So yeah, no, I've never. Never, uh, never picked up and partaked. And now I'm almost 40. And everyone's like, are you going to drink when you're 40? I was like, I've made it half my life without putting it to my lips. I don't think I, I should start now. Plus, you know, I'm telling you, I saved so much freaking money. 
But I quit drinking almost five years ago. Next month will be my five year mark. Thanks. And uh, it, it, I can tell you, I was like, one, I the weight I dropped in the first month, I was like, that's what beer has been doing. That's where that, okay, I got it. Beer. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little holding spot. But no, the, the amount of money saved was was tremendous, you know, because it's, it's it, I didn't have super crazy high tastes, but I was like, yeah, wow, I'm spending a lot. And uh, then that just got diverted, you know, it's like, eh, it goes to some hunting funds, right? You know, it's you gotta <laughs> get yeah, out. No, to... I, I have, I have companies that send me wines, whiskeys, beers, you know, I'll cook with this. I cook with it, but they send me like a case of like 60 bottles of bourbon. I'm like, <laughs> I can only make so much barbecue sauce or, you know, I can only cook. So, so then it's always like Christmas gifts to all my friends. I'm like, yeah. oh, hey. this is like a $70 bottle of bourbon. I was like, yeah, cause I love you. They're like, you got it for free. Right. I'm like, yeah, have Merry Christmas. There's 30 more in the back. Yeah. <laughs> if you like it, come and get another one. I got a case under my garage. You mentioned Dove and you hired bringing other people out there. Is your classes that you in Texas, is that, are you doing like Dove classes when you're in, in Cali too? No. Okay. No. Uh, California, you have to have a guide license to yeah. do classes and got stuff it. like that. Okay. That's why I do, everyone always asks me, why do you do so much stuff in Texas? It's like, because I can. Yep. Um, and there's, there's, yep. there's, there's no requirements for it, uh, for teaching and, you know, and I know a lot of the fish and game guys. So it's asking them questions will like, so technically if you like in the state of Texas, if you're quartering out a deer, you're, if it's hanging in a, say you have an MLD tag, if it's hanging in there, the deer technically can't be quartered out, um, until you leave the ranch because they're having to identify that deer without those cuts. And so what we found out is that we can use, um, big, uh, meat lugs, big bins. And if you keep the animal, the head, that everything's still hanging there. And if you cut off meat and put the chunks in there below that animal with the tag, what that does is that still identifies that animal and that. So it's like, we get, we, we can get away with a lot of things. And a lot of people are like, Oh, you're not supposed to do well after clarifying, as long as they can identify, they can pick those stakes and put them back on that, on that leg. Um, then it, the deer is good to go until it's vacuum sealed. And, but once it's vacuum sealed and ready to go home, there's no problems with it. But it's when that animal's still hanging because we'll we'll do like front shoulders at a t- as a class, back back legs as a class, back you know middle strap. And so as long as we keep all those bones, that fish and wildlife can come and check, then we're completely safe and good. And so, oh, that's good, man. That's good. Yeah. No. So the classes uh, we have, we're trying to line up turkey a turkey class this year. Um, but when the p- people do come to the classes in Texas, we do hunt because it is open second dove season. So we'll do dove, we'll do quail. Um, last year we were doing it. We got in this big old covey of blue quail. And so taught people how to track quail, how to shoot quail, shot a bunch. And then literally we just pulled over to the side and I just built a fire. Like we, we found like a, a migrant fire pit that they were using. And we just sat down, lit a fire with all their crap they had there. And then we cooked blue quail over the fire and everyone just sat there and ate, talked about the story. And then we, kept driving along. So, um, there are many, but rabbits and any, anything that pops up, we can shoot like a deer class becomes a deer class and a predator class when that, when that problem arises. Um, but the main goal is to get you that deer. Once that's done, like we go out in the evenings and it's like, if it's, if it's legal season, it's going to die. Yep. So one of the last things I wanted to know is where people can find you. Where is the, I, mean, I know you got your website, you got your Instagram handle, you got some videos, you got a podcast. Why don't you tell people where it's best to find you? Yeah, uh, it's really easy. Most of it is just from field to plate. Uh, so from field to plate.com is the website. Uh, the lady who's doing my website is blowing me up like crazy because we're building a whole new interactive website. So it's literally kind of a click and play type website where you can really get in depth. Like we talked about in the beginning of the podcast about what to do with a sirloin roast. You'll be able to click on a sirloin roast and it'll take you to every recipe that I have that includes that roast and so it's going to be very, very interactive and it's time consuming. It's been like a year and a half, but it's got to be done right. Uh, so from field to plate.com on Instagram, from field to plate. If you go on Twitter, it's from, I don't ever really go on there, but it is on there from field, the number two plate, because apparently one too many um, characters. And uh-huh. then Instagram or Pinterest, Facebook, uh, from field to plate. I have two things that are from field to plate. You can follow like my normal you know, you kind of the page you build, but then I also started a group on there from field to plate, the group. It's got like 15,000 members on there and it's all about food and the process of it. And people are literally all day long sharing their creations and their stories around hunting. Uh, If it's not a story or food or related video, it gets deleted. 
and they get a warning. So it's not full of spam and crap and everything else. It's literally just littered full of food and ideas and respect. If you disrespect someone on there, you're booted instantly. I don't care. No questions asked. Um, because I don't care if the food looks like crap, respect it. And so you can follow it on that, uh, Pinterest from field to plate, uh, YouTube from field to plate, all that stuff. I've got a ton of videos coming down the pipeline starting about January, working on them all this fall for from field to plate. Uh, but if you want to go learn how to bake, break down a back leg, I have videos on each muscle group, about two and a half minute videos. that really helps you break down that back leg, uh, and not feel so intimidated by going to a page that says 22 minutes for a video. This is, hey, how do I take off the top round? Click it. It's two minutes of how to take off the top round and how to clean it. So, um, but yeah, pretty much you just type in from field to plate on Google, everything will pop up and you can see my ugly mug on there and uh, go from there. So like, like my father-in-law did. <laughs> well, man, I, I appreciate you coming on and, and I, I really enjoyed our conversation. I'm, I'm very excited. I uh, got a lot of anticipation about, you know, the project you kind of hinted at. Um, when that is in full throttle, you come back in here and you can announce it, you know, right before it drops, love to, to share everybody, uh, share that with everybody. And, uh, once again, thank you for, for, um, you know, coming in here and, and sharing your talents with us in the world and, uh, helping to inspire people to, to get out there from field to plate. Jeremiah Dowdy. Thank you so much. Anytime. Take Appreciate care, it. Everyone. Take care.